Well, we are back with another episode of the Room for Nuance podcast. I'm Sean DeMars, and I'm here with my guest. Ryan Robertson. Brother, will you open us in prayer? Yeah, Lord, thank you for uh, just the opportunity to have a conversation with a friend. God, we pray that our conversation would glorify you. I pray that it would edify us. Lord, I pray that you would keep us from saying things that are unhelpful. And Lord, and that you would uh, just give us words to say by your spirit that are encouraging for the building up of your church around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, Ryan, before we uh, get started, uh, Luke was telling me that you're a bit of a, uh, you enjoy nature. And so you'd probably appreciate this little factoid about ants. Did we talk about nature? Well, maybe we did. Yeah. All right. I love nature. Yeah. uh, Here we go. I learned the other day that all ants are female. That's great. Yeah. That's if great. they were males, they'd be called uncles. <laughs> Man, <laughs> yes. we're done. Uh, this, okay. was, this was this is the whole reason I came. Aren't you right glad there. you came to Alabama? Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. All and right. cut. All right. <laughs> Brother, why don't you just start by sharing uh, like a three to five minute version of your testimony just yeah. so we can yeah learn a little bit more about you? Great. Yeah. Um, name's Ryan Robertson. Uh, we live in Louisville, Kentucky. We being my wife, Erin. Uh-huh. My three kids, Avery is 16, Calum is 14, Regan is 12, mm. and uh, they're wonderful. I wish they could just travel with me everywhere I go. Yeah, uh, We are at Third Avenue Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky, where I serve as an elder alongside Greg Gilbert. Um, you should get Greg on here. I've Greg tried great. I've tried a thousand times. He said times. no. Uh, he, says, he says, yes, let's get it on the calendar, which I guess is a no. I will get you his PA's uh, uh, email address by the time we're done. Okay. There we go. Greg, right. you've been called out. Yes. <laughs> so grew up in Canada, born and raised. Uh, and I'm so uh, sorry, it's, brother. It's cold. Yeah. Um, I loved growing up in Canada. We just, we grew up just outside of Toronto in a very multicultural area Okay. called Brampton, a uh, huge South Asian population, a lot of Indian, Pakistani friends, mm. uh, a lot of Chinese friends. The Lord was just wonderful to give me just a multicultural childhood in yeah. many different ways. Great, great food scene. In Ooh, Toronto. Yeah, it was, I bet. Oh, it was so good. Louisville, they talk about their food scene. It's nothing compared to Toronto. Because in Toronto, it's authentic, right? You get it's it's real. Yeah. Like it, the stuff comes off the plane uh-huh. at Pearson Airport from India and Vietnam and China, and then it goes to the restaurant. It's yeah. not this made up stuff that yeah, a bunch America of white people has. trying to do ethnic food. It's true. Yeah. It's true. And then okay. when the mothers cook it for you and not the restaurant, <sighs> ten times better. God. As far as I remember, as long as I remember, I grew up at Bramley Baptist Church uh, with believing parents who week in, week out, heard the gospel. And so I gave my life to to the Lord at a very young age. Okay. Um, After Christmas Cantata, I think it was 1988, 1987, 1988, sitting there with my cousins, I asked them, what does it take to become a follower of Jesus Christ? They told me, and uh, I truly believe that's when the Lord converted me. Mm. Super thankful for that. Yeah. And I was baptized uh, probably four or five years later. Uh, I'm not an advocate for baptizing a lot of uh, yeah. young kids, but you know, that was, that was me then. Baptist's yeah. going to baptize. So there we were. <laughs> yeah. And uh, grew up wanting to be in full-time ministry. Uh, wanted to go to Liberty University. Uh, Why Liberty? Our, our youth pastor had went to Liberty. And so there was this really weird video that was in our church library kind of a recruitment video and I watched it oh. and as a teenager and I was like, oh, I want to go to that place. Okay. I was playing basketball at the time. I started getting recruited by Liberty. I would go down to their basketball camps and in the middle of recruitment, uh, junior year of high school, committed to go to Liberty. Uh, yeah. I was more kind of looking at mid-majors at that point and Liberty just stood up above, yeah. far above and beyond everywhere else. I'm going to put my hands under here because your fine. table squeaks That's fine. like crazy. Yeah. Sorry, man. All good. Uh, so went to Liberty, committed to Liberty, and then I just started dating my my wife, my now wife, kind of last semester of high school. Okay. And she ended up deciding that she wanted to go to Liberty too, which was a win for me. No long distance relationship. Right. Yeah. We went down to Liberty together. I went from wanting to be a pastor to in my last year of high school, just getting absolutely spooked about the whole idea of pastoral ministry, which I yeah. think is good for an eighteen year old to kind of oh, bear yeah. that weight. Oh yeah. Go. Ah, I'm not really cut out for this. Well, now, were you spooked because you came to understand like the the gravity of it? Totally. I loved public speaking. I loved the idea of just preaching mm-hmm. on a Sunday morning and then just realizing as I got older, hey, pastoral ministry has a lot more to do uh, with yeah. counseling and care than it does just speaking on a Sunday morning. Oh, yeah. Um, so I think what a pastor does on a Sunday morning is the most important thing he does mm-hmm. as a senior pastor. But for me, I was I was not interested in the counseling care at that point, being yeah. a self-involved teenager. Mm-hmm. So I decided to pursue finance. I uh, went and got a finance degree at Liberty. 
and uh, left Liberty to do. Well, sorry, what was Liberty like at that time? Uh, so Jerry Fowell Sr. was still around. Okay. Uh, he was amazing. Got to know him well. I served on the board of Old Time Gospel Hour in Canada, which is super weird when I look back at that going like, why on earth is that like I do that? Is it like a radio that? program? It was like a TV program with Jerry and the choir behind him. It was their, I think it was their Sunday evening services taped. Yeah. And uh, they wanted uh, a young Canadian on the board. And so I went on the board as like a 20 year old. Yeah. Totally underqualified, unqualified. And just loved our time together. So Liberty at that time, uh, Jerry Falwell Sr. was still around. I uh, was working on the Old Time Gospel Hour uh, kind of television production that they were doing. I was serving on their board. I love Jerry Sr. Uh, we would have differing. Can you? I don't. I don't understand much about the history of the Falwells. I, it's, it feels like when I hear that name, that would be a controversial statement for you to say. I love Jerry Fal Falwell. Uh, Jerry Falwell Sr. Senior. was a, a wonderful man. I okay. think it is controversial. I think my love for him. I think. Jerry and I would have different views right now on things like uh, how we should think about influencing the nation for Jesus. Okay. Um, Jerry was very much uh, one of the founders of the moral majority yeah, in the, the 1980s. 80s. Yeah. Super thankful for Jerry. Okay. Um, he, he would just do things differently than I would mm -hmm. at, at this stage yeah. of my life. But it doesn't take away from how much I love the man. Okay. And I loved my time at Liberty. So okay. Liberty, when Jerry passed away, um, Liberty... From what I can understand, I'm not an expert on it. Sure. Jonathan Falwell took the ministry of Thomas Road Baptist Church, Thomas Thomas Road Baptist Faithful Church in Lynchburg, Virginia. Okay. And uh, Jerry Jr., his son, trained as a lawyer at UVA, took the helm of Liberty University itself. And they, I think, just had different visions of what ministry looked like. Yeah. And so Jerry Jr. made some astute business decisions and Liberty blew up. Uh -huh. Not in a bad way at first. Okay. Uh, in, a, in a good way at first. They did a lot of online stuff before anybody else. Hmm. And literally, they got to the point where they had like a billion dollars of assets on the balance sheet, which you look at the way Jerry Sr. managed it financially. Liberty was nothing close to that. We were, we were on the edge of financial disaster uh, a few different times because he was more ministry oriented more ministry oriented yeah. uh they had had a thing in the 80s or 90s where they had a whole bunch of bonds that grandmas had bought through the old time gospel hour and then they couldn't repay the bonds oh. someone came along and bought them for pennies on the dollar yeah that was a hard situation there's wow. books out there about jerry and his impact on evangelicalism the good the bad and the ugly oh, okay. but i loved i loved him as a man he would yeah. drive down in his suv down campus have this weird horn and all of a sudden like his suburban would jump the curb and you'd be like jumping into the bush to avoid it and you'd look up and he's like chuckling kind of well just waving at you yeah and so he wasn't acting weird or deranged it was just jerry showing like hey i see you love you i'm just gonna keep yeah. driving i too try to run people over when i want them to know how much i love them. well have a really cool horn <laughs> yeah and then it, 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 it kind of yeah. seems goofy what's weird all of a sudden becomes quirky and sort of totally. endearing yeah. yeah i think it was more like a road runner like something like that so it's like ah jerry there you go you had to be there, there yeah, you, had, you, yeah. you had to be there but okay. jerry uh jerry senior wonderful man jerry jr just took the university in a different way yeah um, and i don't think it was the, the liberty that i attended uh, okay. I think they've made recent changes that have me very, very hopeful. Oh, they good. brought in a new president. Uh, there's a lot of controversy out there around Jerry Jr. They brought in a guy named Dondi Costin, PhD. I think at least one of his PhDs from Southern Seminary. Okay, um, but uh, former military guy, just great resume. Faculty love him. Yeah, all great. of that stuff. So yeah, Liberty was great. We loved our time there. Okay, uh, I thought I was going to play basketball. Lord had different plans. Yeah, um, I couldn't make a decision between basketball and uh school so uh i chose school i had to make a decision so yeah. i chose school uh came came out of our senior year went back to toronto became a accountant auditor as boring as that sounds it was even more boring yeah. being in boardroom after boardroom looking at financial statements for month after month after month i cannot imagine a life more boring than being an accountant in canada well, you could be an actuary in canada that's actually worse uh, those I, are the people that evaluate the mathematical risk of accidents happening and then oh yeah premiums. that's right so that okay. would be more boring um, <laughs> yeah. i almost became an actuary and a friend of mine uh, was like no you should be an accountant great all right sure sounds like a lot of fun compared yeah. to actuarial science so you're doing that hate doing your that. life <laughs> uh, i hate my life got into cfo work uh, at a few different companies chief financial officer mm -hmm. Um, kind of moving up. And then in 2011, Red Radical. Ah. Um, Radical changed my life. It's um, done that to a lot of people. It's, yeah, literally. Uh, we almost, we were on the edge of financial disaster uh, because I just made radical decisions yeah. after reading Radical that yeah. I should not have made. Again, financial professional. Yeah. Textbook knowledge. 
but yeah. hey, I wanted to be radical. Can so, we pause here yeah. and talk about that? I, I don't want you to say anything to get you on the wrong side of radical and David Platt. You Love guys you, David. work together in the missions world. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember reading radical as well when I was deployed and it got me very seriously thinking about missions. I yeah. think that book, the Lord used it to get me and my family to the mission field, yep. uh, among other things. Uh, and then I went back and I read it a little bit later and you know, sometimes books don't change, but we do. Yeah. And I, I didn't, it didn't read the same way, but I, I found, especially kind of in reform circles after Michael Horton's book came out, which was meant to be sort of a rejoinder to it. Uh, You're talking about ordinary. Yeah, yeah. And the marketing on that was fantastic. No, whoever no. did that, but like, it, it almost feels like it's kind of cool now to go back and dump on radical a little bit, but man, the Lord really used that book to open a lot of people's eyes to wake them up to the sort of mundane, blah, non-Great Commission way that they were living. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. So anyways, can you reflect on, on look like, okay, so it helped you, but also you went a little too far, like you went crazy. Like, how do you interpret that? Yeah, now? I think, I think uh, looking at myself in my 20s, uh, I was already prone from a personality perspective to take big swings. Uh, and okay. do things drastically. I was not a calm, cool, collected patient person in my 20s. And so I read that book, did not go seek pastoral counsel, just mm -hmm. literally just made up my own mind. Okay, mm. here's how I'm going to mm. adapt this book and adopt it as kind of a mantra for my life. And yikes. Yeah. Uh, my, my elders ended up calling me two weeks after reading the book. And they were like, hey, we're, we're thinking maybe you should come and meet with us. And I thought, oh, I'm in trouble. Like when your elders call you middle of the week, hey, yeah. can you come in and talk? Yeah. You're getting at, called at the church the I was in, office. I was like, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, in, I'm in trouble. They ended up saying, hey, we want you to come on staff. Mm. And I, I had a number in my mind. I was like, okay, I, I think I can make this work for like this much money. And it was like way lower than that. Okay. And I took something like a 75%, 80% pay cut to go work for the local church. And I thought, man, that... That's radical. <laughs> yeah. That's super radical. Yeah. I had a, I had a Toyota Yaris lease. Ooh. And, uh, a lease, a lease. You're a finance guy. 0% like. financing baby. Oh my. Yeah. And it was okay. a Toyota. So it was worth way more okay. a trade in than what the buyout was. So Whatever there was some financial incentive. Yourself. I know okay. it's not a good financial move, children. <laughs> but, uh, I ended up having to get my sister to assume my lease, oh. which is super embarrassing. My, my baby sister, yeah. comes and like takes my $190 Canadian payment and runs with it yeah. because I can't even afford my Yaris. And yeah. so I was biking to work, walking in like minus 20 degree weather <laughs> to the church from our home, <coughs> just trying to do the radical thing. Yeah. And so I think, I think if I could go back to 2011 and talk to Ryan with the orange book in his hands, I would have said, before you make any decisions about this book, just maybe read it again with an elder. Yeah. And and ask questions like, hey, what do you think? What do you think about this? What do you think about this? I have yeah. an older man. I should have read it with my dad. My dad's super wise man. Mm. Super love him. I get to work with him now at reaching and teaching. But uh, man, I should have just asked an older man to walk with me through some of those decisions. Because the theology and a lot of the principles aren't wrong. It's usually people who'd kind of take it and run wild with it. You could have had someone say, okay, what does it look like to apply this truly biblical vision of like radical following of Jesus? to my life in a way that's wise and not dangerous. Totally. Well, you even look at the illustration on the front. It wasn't that helpful, like upside down house. Yeah. To a young guy in his 20s, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to turn my house upside down and show you how <laughs> radical I am. I never um, thought about that. Yeah. It was it, it was it was a helpful book. It was not unhelpful for me not to read that book with somebody yeah. wise. One of the things I tell people all the time is you also have to remember the context that David was writing in. He was at a very wealthy church yeah. in Birmingham where like 80% of the cars in the parking lot in the very big parking lot are luxury vehicles. Yeah. Everyone's super comfortable. And and I, I get it. You, know, you have to be aware of the broader context, but that, that really was the context that he was writing to and, and trying to correct. And so when you're trying to break down a big idol like that, you kind of have to take a big swing. A big hammer, a big yeah. hammer. And I think the Lord can use books like that and others to to press in our hearts. I was sinfully caught up in a, in, in a pursuit of materialism and mm. status and more money. And I needed to be wrecked. I needed my pride taken to task, but yeah. it would have been super helpful if it wasn't from a pages of a book alone. And yeah. it was with one of my elders walking Amen. with me through it. So. Yeah. Okay. So you read Radical. You read were Radical. An idiot. <laughs> yeah. I was an idiot. Yeah. I almost bankrupted the family and started working for our local church. I uh, did that in 2011 for seven years. So okay. was director of finance. Uh, we had this huge, big multi-million dollar building expansion. Um, again, it's probably not the like the most 
radical, radical thing. The radical purists were going to the mission field. Right. Again, I'm trying to both end it going yeah. like, all right, so I'll be radical and personally uh-huh. go be radical, but like, this is great. And, and I'm, I'm super thankful for that church. I'm super thankful for the building. You just you hear the irony in it. Like, yeah, I, I went, oh, yeah. read radical and then I went and helped finance a, a massive multi-million dollar building. Yeah. Okay. Um, but that church has been super, super helpful. And I think they work with radical now. So they're oh. full circle. Full there you circle. go. Um, but yes, yeah, so did that for seven years. In 2014, 2015 area, we were planted by James McDonald's church in Chicago. I don't know mm. if many of you of uh, viewers Harvest, right? Harvest Bible Chapel. Our pastor had been mentored by James. The church was planted in 2004, just outside of Toronto. We ended up going there after we returned back from Liberty. Uh, love the pastoral staff there, got to serve alongside of them. But James and some of his issues started to kind of come up to the surface 2014, 2015. Yeah. And I started to ask questions on polity in 2014, 2015. And Can I just, you just define that? Yeah, polity, uh, how does the church order itself? Yeah. Uh, how do, specifically, how do elders in a congregation work together? Yeah, how does authority flow? How through? does the yeah. authority, does, do the elders ultimately hold the keys of the kingdom, the authority, or do, does a local congregation? James, or some outside board. Or some outside <laughs> board, yep. Hello, Presbyterian friends, so. Oh, hello, shots fired, yeah, let's, yeah. let's go. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, but so we, I started asking questions about that and discovered the writing of Nine Marks yeah. uh, as in my kind of pilgrimage. Started asking some questions and I wasn't fully convinced of the biblical arguments that I was being given. Uh, dive, dove into- At, at your at, church? At our church, okay. at our church. Which was Elder Ruled? Elder Ruled. Okay. Uh, super thankful for those brothers. They're really good friends. Um, but I just, I came to a different conclusion on who holds the authority of yeah. the keys within a local church. And I knew at that point, all right, I think the Lord's leading us as a family into something different. My conscience is just a little too tight on this yeah. for me to be able to stay on staff forever. Yeah. While it's too tight, your conscience is too tight. <laughs> Everything's too tight, you know? Yeah. Um, but we decided to to loosen up a little bit and uh, move to America. So mm. I had been taking studies at Southern Seminary. I uh, got to know one taking of- Taking studies? Is that like the way you guys say that in, in Canada? Canada? Everything we say in Canada is yeah. is grammatically correct compared oh. to Americans. So <laughs> okay. do not be judging my grammar. Sorry, that's Sean, my thank bad. You, thank okay. you, thank uh, you. Yeah, we, you take studies. Yeah. Don't you guys say that in America? No, yeah, we go to hospital. You, you go know, to hospital. We take we go we go on holiday. You go to you go to studies. Yeah, what, do you guys do maths? You, uh no, but I like maths more than I like math. Really? Yeah. Well, you're Did an you, idiot. you just watch the new uh, Apple TV episode where they were talking about this? No. Uh the new Masters of the Air, they talk about maths versus math. Oh no. All right. It makes a lot of sense. I should watch show. it. They, what you're yeah, just okay. launched on Friday. Okay. Launched is that a pun? Ooh, Ooh, I like it. Come on. Wait, you are so quicker than me, brother. <laughs> uh, so we we decided as a family uh, through those studies at Southern Seminary that making a transition, possibly to do doctoral studies down at Southern, was okay. was what the Lord. Did you already have us. your master's degree? Uh, I had a master's degree in business administration. Oh. Was leveling up at seminary, doing seminary like gotcha. crazy. Yeah. Uh, in 2017, in kind of the the full on blitz of like, let's get studies done. I ended up finding out I had Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, which I thought was just going to derail everything. Can you can you tell the viewers what that is? Yeah, Hodgkin's lymphoma is a type of cancer in your uh, lymph nodes. Yeah, uh, it's a blood cancer, so yeah. to speak. So your filtration system was was totally up. messed up. Okay. I I was training for the New York Marathon. Ooh. I know you can't see it on my face now, uh, but I was. I was pretty skinny, just trying okay. to get down. I wanted to qualify for Boston, okay. losing weight like crazy. And okay. I just kept losing weight. And uh, I thought I was going through spiritual burnout just because of some of the yeah. things that were going on in my life. And nope, I had Hodgkin's lymphoma. Oh. So I uh, had an amazing oncologist. Um, shout out to Dr. Trinkus. I don't think she'll ever watch this, but no, the, shout out nonetheless. The, the healthcare system of Canada. Oh, don't do came, it. Came in. <laughs> don't they, do they, it. No, oh, man. <laughs> you've just lost. 30% uh, of your, I've lost I mean, like 90% life. of my What donors. can I say, dude? What can I say? Uh, so. Tell the for, truth. How long did you have to wait for chemo? Five years? Not, not a chance. <laughs> I was, I was, I went from having my biopsy to being in chemo in I think seven days. What, was it one of those things where like, you were like, not going to the doctor like a typical man and your wife was like, you really need to go to the doctor. Uh, every woman in my life, my mother, my wife, 
my see the reason i say my mom first because my mom said it way more than my wife did okay because you know moms they're just yeah. like always on your case and so my mom was always on my case my my aaron was i think just trying to be supportive and but at the same time she was like honey something's wrong with yeah. you and in her mind she's like what is wrong with my husband yeah uh the, the ladies at the church that i worked on staff with they would come in some of them like even in tears saying like something is wrong with you yeah. and one of them said like i had a dream that you had cancer and i'm like oh. well that's kind of weird oh uh, i definitely don't have cancer <laughs> yep i did have haven't cancer. been checked but I'm, trust me <laughs> <laughs> trust me i'm good i I'm know good. my own body <laughs> and, uh, and this is like over the course of months i'm guessing right yeah i had lost they they by the time i got tested the level of cancer they said i had it for about a year Oof. Um, but because i was so active uh, they said there's no way that you would have been able to mm. to check in on it. It was really the last, I think, four months before I was diagnosed that were okay. rocky. So, so again, got super in. low. Got in. The Lord uh, healed me. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lord, for that. And back on my feet, Hodgkin's lymphoma is super treatable. So you hear about like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. There's a whole bunch of different types. Some of okay. them are kind of terminal and some of them are not. Yeah. Hodgkin's lymphoma is a super treatable form of cancer if you catch it in time. Okay. Uh, it, the chemo sucks. So they just absolutely rocked my body with chemo. Yeah, sorry, man. Six months of difficulty. But the Lord used that again to just kind of break me. Yeah. Uh, I needed to be brought to the point where I, I knew that I just, I might not live. Yeah. At, at before kind of getting the final diagnosis. And it's like, okay, Lord, like, I get it. You don't need me. I love my family a ton. And I'd love to be here for my like as long as I can be yeah um but it, it kind of just humbles you when you look at ministry aspirations it's like the, the Lord's going to build his kingdom he does not need yeah. me right and so that's just a common reminder even even in days that are really really good that you can get your your flesh can kind of lean mm. in and go look what's going on oh, it's like yeah. nope literally I can be taken out and the Lord's going to build his kingdom yeah so it was a good reminder post post chemo uh, so I, I went into remission in, in 2018 in March, and we moved three months later down to Louisville, Kentucky. Okay. So I uh, was able to raise support, uh, start talking with an organization called Reaching and Teaching that I now lead about coming on staff with lead, them. Lead? What's your position? I'm King the president of Reaching and Teaching. No, King Mr. sounds Pre good. But Should I call you Mr. President? I never do. That would be super awkward. Okay. Yeah. What does Brooks make you call him? Mr. President. Okay, then just Ryan. <laughs> or or President Brooks. President Brooks. Or uh, the most honorable, the, the most OG. high honorable Brooks. Yeah, guy. I call him Crocodile Hunter because he's got all these cool crocodile skulls in, oh, his, yeah. in his basement that, oh yeah, I killed that one or yeah, oh, whatever. He's the coolest guy. I ever. grew up with moose in Canada. What can I say? Yeah. So that's, <laughs> lame. that's different. Super lame, super <laughs> lame. And they're like 10 hours north, so <laughs> we're not even comparable. Okay. But yeah, um, moved down to join Reaching and Teaching uh, in a kind of a creative access role where I was going to help missionaries get into closed countries mm. um, using creative means. Because there's really no such thing as a closed country from God's perspective. From God's right? perspective. We just got to figure it out. Roll up our sleeves. Yeah. Let's figure this out. Yeah. And uh, when I was hired and moved our family down, I realized like there was nobody to work with because all of our workers were in like open countries. So I was like in this super awkward phase of like, so what am I going to do? Yeah. And the Lord just allowed for for work to come with reaching and teaching that was not what I originally thought it was going to be. Yeah. And then in 2020, one month into COVID, the board approached me and said, hey, would you be interested in serving as president? Let's backtrack a little yeah. bit. What was your PhD in? So it's it's currently ongoing. Oh. Things have been really busy. Yeah. It's in missions. So missiology. Okay. So doing a doctorate of missiology at Southern Seminary. What thesis? Uh, I'm writing on English speaking churches in global cities. Ooh. I'm going to get absolutely wrecked on it uh. by the missions community. But that's great. It's great. They're great. Yeah. I mean, I, I think about like strategic, like what's happening in Turkey, UAE, Dubai. I mean, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit? We'll come back to reaching and teaching. Yeah. Can, yeah can you just absolutely. talk a little bit about the significance of English speaking churches? Yeah, absolutely. Context? So if, if you look at what the Lord has done specifically in East Asia, um, we're going to use a secure word for that because yeah. we got brothers there now yeah. and a place like Dubai, mm -hmm. it's, it's a pretty unique thing when you look at missions history, period. Uh, we, you go to Dubai, we could hop on a plane right now and go to Evangelical Christian Church of Dubai where John Fulmer pastors. You've got a congregation with dozens and dozens and dozens of nationalities. Yeah, uh, They gather together with English as their language, but there's almost 2 billion English speakers around the world. And wow. because of economic migration and forced migration and the economic opportunity given to people who have English as a second language yeah. at a high proficiency, there's a ton of English speakers out there. 
Yeah. And so rather than having 75 different <coughs> local churches that are homogenous, there's yeah. one local church. You look about you, you look at Ephesians 2 where Paul talks about how the gospel has broken down the walls of hostility mm -hmm. between us, Jew you and see Gentile. It right there. Wow. It's beautiful. You got Indians and Pakistanis. You've got you 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 could have Palestinians and Israelis. You could have Ukrainians and Russians mm. and it, they're all gathered together in one local church saying the kingdom of God trumps any political mm. power that exists in this world. Amazing. And our citizenship is in heaven. Yeah. And that trumps whatever citizenship here on this earth. So when I hear you say that, I don't hear anything controversial. I don't know why anyone well, would be mad at you. There is something controversial in that because when you look at the, and I think you guys might've talked about him in, in Defend and Confirm, but when you talk about a guy like Donald McGavern and okay. him pushing for the homogeneous principle, okay. which was this idea that churches can grow uh, if everybody is the same. So in order for something to grow, an institution to grow. Yeah. If you've got people with the same socioeconomic background, racial background, and yeah. the more they have in common, the faster that thing's gonna grow. Mm. Well, someone walking into a place where there's people who aren't like them, yeah. uh, it's not naturally a place to grow. Uh, mm. And so from a, from a sociological, missiological perspective, there would be a lot of people who have concerns about it. Mm. Another concern with it, honestly, is the fact that English isn't the quote unquote heart language of maybe 65 of those nationalities that are in that church, which means they speak another language better than they speak English. Mm -hmm. So folks would say like, hey, like they may not fully understand the gospel in their heart language uh, because they're hearing it in English. And how, how would you respond to that? Uh, I look at what Paul's ministry was in, in the early New Testament, and he was speaking in a trade language. Uh, he mm -hmm. was doing ministry in a, in a trade language. Which uh, was? Which was Koine Greek. Yeah. So Koine Greek, English, I think there's a lot of parallels there. Yeah. So you, you look at a church like that, and then out of Evangelical Christian Church of Dubai, they plant Redeemer in Dubai because Dubai is huge. It's growing. Uh, Dave Furman starts pastoring Redeemer. Then you've got Brian Parks, who's at Redeemer, uh, one of the original guys that went over with Max Stiles in the early 2000s. He plants Covenant Hope. There's a, a vibrant campus ministry that's going on the UAE um, through these local churches and a, and a ministry that Mac, Mac found. And then you've got uh, Russell Kaima, Josh Manley, another mm -hmm. faithful local church mm -hmm. there in the Emirate. Uh, you've got Abu Dhabi with Aubrey Sequeira. You've got Fujera with um, Jesse Brannon. Then you're looking at pushing out past west of Abu Dhabi. Like time after time after time, uh, churches are being planted and the nations are gathering together to worship King Jesus. Yeah. Okay, and they're gathering in these very historically hostile areas. That's what's so significant. Yeah, and they're coming from historically hostile <laughs> areas. Right. So the amount of effort and money it would take for, for you and I to move over mm. to a Pakistan and train up pastors in Pakistan, if we could even get in the country, right. is it's huge. But these guys can come and do an internship for six months to a year, mm. be part of a healthy local church, experience where the healthy local church is, do the hard work of, okay, how does this contextually fit within our context yeah. back in Nepal or Pakistan or India? And then they do it. And it's not 100% successful. I don't think anything is 100% sure. successful in church planning, but you see story after story after story in the Middle East and in Asia of God's grace through these English speaking embassies. And when we look at United Nations statistics, they say that almost 60% of the world's population are gonna be living in urban centers by 2050, 2060. Okay. And so what I wanna say is like, hey, we've got a common language uh, in English that's being used in economic trade. I'm not saying it's the only sure. strategy. I'm just saying like, it's, it's a, a strategy. It's, and it's a good strategy. And our friends are bearing fruit from it. And so let's not- And it's not, not like we're, we're impressing this. It's not like we're saying you have to come and be Western and be English. It's absolutely just, not. It's just the truth. There are Christians in these places who want to gather and worship. Yeah. And they speak English. That's absolutely right. It's just an opportunity that's there. That's absolutely right. And I think another benefit of them is where you can, you've got folks moving to, to do work in the local national dialect or a local language. They're going to have to learn language. Well, where are they going to gather as a local church? Right. Sometimes well, yeah. it's a small little house church, and that's that's great. great. As long as all the elements of church there, that's yeah. great. But sometimes you can learn Arabic or insert the language while being a member of an English-speaking church yeah. and membering well for your first year or two, mm. and then going and joining or planting an, an, a church in another language. And I think that's a super important element. So yeah. what I'm arguing for is okay. there's really good missiology within English speaking churches. And let's not neglect the opportunity that we have 
here in 2025 and beyond with English speaking churches. And then using an East Asia case study and a Dubai case study is like, okay, this is how I think it's missiologically responsible in certain places. Mm. Yeah. I'm even thinking through the lens of my own experience at, at CHBC, even what you see in, throughout church history, it seems like there are often these hubs that sort of hoover people in, you know, the Lord just kind of appoints them to be the, like people come in and then they go out through there and then they disperse the DNA that they get while they're there. So, so think about how many people have come through the internship at CHBC yeah. and then transmit that DNA all over the world. Or you think about Calvin's Geneva, right? Like John Knox came through Geneva, got the DNA, took it back uh, to Scotland and led the reformation there. So it just seems like this model even historically makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And then you even look at Paul. Paul was working in economically vibrant areas like Thessaloniki. Uh, he was Corinth. working in Corinth yeah. and Ephesus. Like these were not like Rome. Yeah. Like, okay, these these places are super important. And yeah. uh, there's a lot of economic vitality there and a lot of transient community. And yeah. so people can come into a Washington, D.C. or Dubai. They can catch a vision for healthy church and as they continue to migrate out or back home, they're bringing that DNA with them. Mm. And do you do you interact at all with like Keller's whole thing on an emphasis on the city? City to city. Yeah, yeah. I think he's got some good stuff. We would differ on things ecclesiologically. Yeah. Um, I think he... But his he, emphasis on like, if we want to be at the fountainhead of missions, we have to be in the cities. Yeah, I think so. But I, I, I want to be cautious because even now... People are watching this going like, I cannot believe this guy is like only talking about cities. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the problems that we have in our culture today, and then even specifically missions discussions is the either or equation. Mm. So just because I'm trying to emphasize, okay, these are super important. I don't want to negate the opportunity to say, hey, we should also be going to languages that have never heard the gospel before, let alone someone speak English. So it's right. like the both, both, yeah, both and. cities and places that have never heard the gospel in their language. Both and. Gotcha. Um, but I do think, I, th I think Keller has a lot of, uh, to me, compelling arguments in center church. And when he's talking about a city to cities initiative, that like cities matter and they're mattering more and more. Mm -hmm. And again, contextualization, we would probably differ on some of the ways that happen. Of course, yeah. But man, if you if, if we're talking about places like Singapore where Eugene Lowe is right now, we're mm -hmm. talking about Bangkok with a guy like Matt Tyler and Spanny, Danny Spandler Davidson there. We're talking about places like Hong Kong and, and so many other global cities around the world. Yeah. And you can point to those and say, hub, hub, hub. Hub does not have to be English speaking. Sure. Right. But we can get a lot of resources in under the context of international church mm -hmm. with local authorities going, oh, that's just expats doing their thing mm -hmm. without recognizing like there's tremendous opportunity to impact locals kind of through that through that kind of hub mentality. So by a hub, you mean a place where people are flowing in and they're going to take what they get with them back to wherever they're going to go. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And some of it's going to stay there and just overflow. Sure. Right. Yeah. So you some like a place like Dubai, there's a number of healthy churches now in Dubai, praise God, um, all because I think four or five couples originally landed mm. in Dubai at the Evangelical Christian Church of Dubai and just sat themselves there. Did they go there with the intention of planting an English speaking church? No, it was a revitalization. They went, uh, so Mac and then the Lawrences and the parks. Uh, so the styles, the Lawrences and the parks went like over. Michael Lawrence? No, David Lawrence. Okay. He's now in Erbil, Iraq, English speaking church. Uh, they went over to be part of a campus ministry, to start a campus ministry yeah. in the Middle East. As they saw, honestly, before most people, the opportunity in Dubai. Yeah. And launched out of student ministry and then mac wanted to be a member of a local church because mm. he's a good church guy yeah and uh you should get him on here the story's I, amazing I, I add him to the list of people i've tried Greg to get on. and mac yeah get down here to decay he, he hasn't even responded to my emails all right I, he doesn't even have i get it i wouldn't yeah. respond to my That's emails right. I'll, I'll give you leanne's email address and you can ask her <laughs> Thanks, to send them yeah but they go to join a local church and it just needs a revitalization. Okay. It had been planted 30 years earlier. But it was um, planted 30 years ago in English? It was planted 50 years ago in English. Oh. Yeah, in the 70s. And the story, uh, John Fulmer tells it really well, uh, and he actually put a book out on it. But there were Christian missionaries in the desert where the Emirates are now that were there before anybody discovered oil. And they were faithfully ministering to, oh, the, wow. to the Emiratis as yeah. they were like a wandering people. And I think one of the original sheikhs was born in a missionary hospital. Oh. 
and the original sheikhs of the UAE, I think maybe even the founding one. And so he had made the statement to the early missionaries that you were here before anybody even knew we had oil because you loved us. Wow. And the Lord just used that to open up opportunities for yeah. them. Like there's literally church buildings in Dubai under the watchful guise of the sheikh. Yeah. That's Incredible. crazy. And he's given land over for it. And it's, yeah. it's nuts. It's, are you going to take, uh, PhDs are basically unreadable to the layperson. Are right. you going to popularize this? And yeah, I'm going to popularize it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it, brother. Right. I am too. Back to reaching and teaching. Yeah, back to reaching So teaching. you start off as the bus boy. Yep, effectively. <laughs> you have a job that you don't really know how to do, but then, wow, you really prove yourself. They come to you. They ask you to be the president. Yeah, I I always joke. So it was 2020. One of my CFO gigs, Sean, was I, I was working in an aerospace defense company that was going under, and I was just helping it gently Pass go under. Into the night. That's yeah. right. <laughs> So I thought like, is this what these guys are asking me to do? It's wow. the beginning of COVID. We had had a couple tra presidential transitions at reaching and teaching. And I thought, okay, this is a cruel, cruel joke, but it looks like I might possibly be guiding this organization kind of through COVID and yeah. helping it unwind. We had no idea what was COVID was gonna be, especially right. internationally. Mm. Um, but the, the board had approached me and just, we had some really clear conversations about where my ecclesiology was and the void that I saw in the missions world as it related to finding an organization that could serve a certain constituency of churches, being those that are like the ones that you and I pastor at. So reformed, baptistic, complementarian churches. Yeah. That And you always say those three things. Yeah. When and, you got on stage in front of 11,000 students at CrossCon a month ago, yep. you said those three things. Saying those three things. And now like my team's like, I think we need to add church-centered Okay. as a fourth. And so I'm trying to remember how to do that. Why, why do you, why do you always say that? Uh, why do I say reformed Baptist complementarian? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, our soteriology is so important in the missions conversations. So, so um, that starting with reformed reformed. Yeah. So like what you believe about God's <clears throat> sovereignty and salvation has a definite impact on how you go about the task of evangelism. Mm. And frankly, it has a lot to do with your disposition as you lay your head down at night. Mm. Um, so because you're going to trust that, uh, yeah. So I am a full on Calvinist and our missionaries lean into the sovereignty of God and we do not pursue quick fix methodologies in order to take shortcuts by which we can bring about people coming to put their faith in Jesus Christ apart from the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. Because like there are just, no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts, yeah. um, to success. Mm. Mm. Somebody should write a book and someone call it should. That. Yeah. That's right. Get Mark Dever right before. Okay. Um, but yeah, I I think for us, God's sovereignty is just so vital. So vital. Yeah. Like we are so dead in our trespasses that we are incapable in our depravity of making a decision to follow Jesus Christ right. without the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit yeah. opening our eyes to the beauty of the gospel. Amen, brother. So So what that means is when we go out and we evangelize by appealing to the flesh we may get something that we perceive to be conversions, but may in fact just be what we see all throughout the book of John. People sort of just getting emotionally worked up, getting excited, but Absolutely. not actually being converted. Absolutely. And then we end up with the prosperity heresy all around the world mm -hmm. because people get really, really excited about something that appeals to their flesh and it grafts in a very satanic way to whatever the local religion is yeah. and it purports to be Christianity. And so God's sovereignty, massive. Reformed, m super important. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I think our, if our main priority is God being maximally glorified, a gospel that ascribes some credit to man and his ability, right? That yeah. detracts from grace. Yeah. It, it's trying to rob God of some measure of his own glory. Amen. You know? So my, my 14 year old boy is being discipled by a guy at our church. They're reading through Romans. Mm -hmm. Callum gets on the car Friday night. And I said, how was, how was your time through Romans with Ethan? And he goes, dad, I cried. Oh. I was like, all right. And I thought it had something to do <laughs> with school, you? right? Oh, like, okay. did a girl break your heart, son? Yeah. No, they're there. But he said, we were talking about election and that God, and I, I believe Callum was, was converted this past summer. Wow. And he said, God chose me. Mm. And he broke into tears yeah. and maximum worship comes out of that yeah. and you're like, okay, my 14 year old worships God in a profoundly different way mm. as he understands that doctrine. Yeah, and I told grace. him, son, you're never gonna get to the end of understanding never. how glorious. Not even in heaven. Not even in heaven. Especially not, not in even heaven. in heaven. You should, you should never 
ever, ever fully comprehend how yeah. glorious and gracious God is. Wow. So then baptistic. Okay. Reformed. Reformed baptistic. baptistic. So we, we got a lot of reformed friends, but um, um, we're not going to be able to serve them all. And so we want to also put in the, the, the category of like, from a, an ecclesiological perspective, we're baptistic. Yeah. And what we mean by that is we believe that Christians are to be baptized, not mm -hmm. children of Christians, mm -hmm. but Christians. And right. we just want to be very, very clear that uh, as we read the Bible, it's very clear that that we respond in obedience to Christ by being baptized as members into a local church. Yeah. Outward sign of an inward reality of faith. Absolutely. I'm sorry, Martin Luther. God does not give the infant faith through some weird mechanism. No. Okay, so baptism. And, and, and I, I kind of wrapped up in that is also membership and discipline. Membership, discipline, right. understanding uh, how authority works, um, making sure that missionaries are very clear with the other people on their team on how those things function. Yeah. And so we've got we've got a, a, a several different brothers that are serving with reaching and teaching, and more. I think that it would be more of like an elder rule persuasion. Yeah, but we're only going to ever come alongside of them and help them get over there if they're working alongside people with similar persuasions, which um, would be uh, elder led congregationalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So we really want to push into that. So yeah. um, baptistic and then complementarian. Okay. Right. So just people who love to pay compliments, just compliments everywhere. All the time. Just nice people. <laughs> just it's, good, nice yeah, people from the Canada. Canadian culture coming yeah. through. Yeah. Are you polite? Great. Come with us. Yes. Uh, no, by complimentary, we believe that scripture is very, very clear as it relates to the role of men and women in the local church, uh, specifically in the role of elder slash pastor slash overseer. Yeah. And so we think that's reserved for men, according to scripture, when mm -hmm. you look at the qualifications. And so we, re we really want to be clear about those things. Um, we added this fourth category, church-centered, okay. because uh, we just want to kind of put it out there that we think that the ends and mean of missions, the means and end of missions is the church. Yes. And so we have friends like Good Churches and Radius and others that kind of all, is, nine marks, we're all espousing the same things. But we also just kind of want to put our hat on that hook saying, okay, we also want to be very, very clear on the front end that this is where we're at. Yeah, after the American Gospel came out, uh, a lot of people asked if I would. I've had several opportunities to go speak about missions because people they love the jungle story and all that, and they tell us stories from the jungle. I don't go talk about any of that. I just go talk about missions in the local church. Yep. That's just it's the only beat on my drum because right. it's just so absent in the missions world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's astounding. It's astounding how many people don't talk about the local church and missions. Mm -hmm. So for, and it, it's astounding because of how intricately connected missions is to the local church in the Bible. Well, well we could take a stack of missions books right now and we would read <clears throat> read way more about culture and anthropology than mm -hmm. we would be about the church. Yeah. And that's crazy to me. Crazy. Um, we need to retrieve the the William Carey-ish kind of impetus of like, let's go establish churches. Let's have churches send people to go establish yes. churches. When people get saved, they're gathered together into this thing called the church. That's right. That's what Peyton was doing. It's what Kerry was doing. It was Hudson Taylor was doing. They were church planning. Yeah. And so we want to get back to that. So that's on the back end, assuming we've done our job and God has been faithful. That's right. On the front end, uh, one of the big issues with missions in the local church is that people uh, don't, don't think that it's the church's job to a train them and B send them. Yeah. Can we can we talk about totally. those in turn? So totally. the, the local church's job in training missionaries, isn't that isn't that naive? I mean, don't we need to send them somewhere? Uh is shouldn't seminary be training people for missions? I mean, can the local church actually train missionaries? Yeah, I think they can. I think the church in Antioch did. Uh I think I think Paul was actually schooled in the school of the Holy Spirit. Um, he was only in Antioch, I think, for one year. Okay. Um, New Testament scholars will leave comments on the below <laughs> right. saying how wrong we are. But yeah. there's one to three for sure. You know, but you, you had religious schools. We know they existed in Jewish culture. We don't see seminaries as they mm -hmm. are in the New Testament. I don't see missions agencies in the New Testament. Don't see those. I see local churches doing local church things by sending out missionaries to equip, to plant, to train, to strengthen, yeah. uh, and evangelize. You see all of those things happening throughout the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So. I, I think what happened, Sean, when I look at missions history, when you look at kind of this great century of missions from 1792 to 1910, you've got William Carey on the front end being sent out of the North Hamp Hamptonshire Association. I think it was like 14 churches in Northern England. Okay. Andrew Fuller was kind of their, the, kind of the, the lead guy in all of that yep. with the most influence. Now they were Baptists, so it wasn't a lead guy in terms of right. authority. It was influence. Yeah. Right? It was influence. a cooperative. That's right. And so you've got William Carey being sent out 
uh, by the British Missionary Society or something like that. It was a really, no, it was like the Missionary Society. Mm-hmm. It was a really original name. Yeah. <laughs> and because we're Baptists. <laughs> just right there in the name. Just right you there. Know the exactly the who Baptist we are. Missionary Society, yeah. get them out. All right. So they send out Carrie, who loved ecclesiology. Um, one of my colleagues just put out a, a little monograph on Carrie's ecclesiology. We don't talk enough about it, but this brother started to wilt because of his absence from a local church mm. as, as he was transitioning over to India. His whole demeanor went down. And then with three other brothers, covenants together as a local church, four of them, mm. four brothers. And he writes back to the church in England and and for a transfer of membership. And they write in their their uh, records in large script, transferring Brother Carey to the watchful care of this local church over wow. in India. And we're writing this in big words so that we can remember God's goodness to our congregation, mm. something like that. And wow. so he loved his ecclesiology. Yeah. You see John Payton, Presbyterian brother, being sent out by the Presbytery in, in Scotland uh, in the 1800s. Payton, uh, Payton did church planning work. He looked to me oddly Baptist as he went about his work yeah. in the New Hebrides, but we're not going to go too much into that. Sure. But then you, you see, and I think it was 1888 was the student volunteer conference in the Northeastern United States. And you had 250 students gather together and uh, for the first kind of the OG student conference. And a oh. hundred, seriously, okay. it was like yeah. the OG Cross, OG Ur- yeah. Urbana. It was yeah. up there in, in North, the Northeastern United did States. Did they also have Indian shaman people opening the event with prayers? No. Like um, Urbana? That, like, I'm glad you said Urbana. I was like, <laughs> we cross. don't do that at no. Cross. Uh, that's why Cross exists in yeah. many different ways. But from, from the student volunteer movement, you have a hundred of the 250 students sign the Princeton pledge that says something like, I'm going to endeavor to give my life to go to the nations. Mm. And I don't see a ton of involvement in the local church in that, Sean. Yeah. Something was going on in the mid 1800s to late 1800s. We got all second of second great awakening stuff. Revivalism was, yeah. was happening. You had student volunteers. And again, Ryan in his twenties, red radical without the council of an elder started to do some pretty crazy things. And I think what happened in 1888 is you had a lot of students getting excited about the evangelization of the world in this generation without being under the watchful care of their elders mm. as this was going on. Yeah. And you had a lot of what are modern day missions agencies being formed by entrepreneurial missionaries who wanted to band together to reach the world in this generation. And the local church all through the eight, through the end of the 1800s and into the 1900s, I think just kind of handed over the missionary task to agencies they handed over the training up of seminaries and seminaries were integral in the early days of America. You, you had all your denominational uh, seminaries that are now Ivy League institutions, Princeton, Harvard, but they all started yeah. to go liberal. And mm-hmm. I think as they started to go liberal because they weren't as connected with local churches and their, the reins weren't there. And so I think what we've got today is just the result of a few hundred years of, of institutions being separated from the local church. Yeah. And it's, it's devastating. And when you look at our, our missiology being implemented around the world today, churches are surprised when they hear what's actually being propagated overseas. Oh, yeah. And it's like, well, how did you not know? Oh, it's because you, you, you've just been You're taught never to ask questions. Yeah. So here's our Those missionary. guys handle that. That's right. Yeah. They're the experts. Yeah. And what I want to say to a local church is, listen, most of what your missionaries believe, they're not believing it in their soul because... Uh, their missions agency taught them this is what your theology is they've sat under your watchful preaching for years and good healthy churches produce good healthy missionaries and pragmatic churches produce pragmatic missionaries and i think there's this messy middle where you've got faithful local churches who are preaching the gospel but have no clue what to do in the area of missions and their people get excited because they're sitting under faithful preaching they get excited to take this gospel to the nations the church is under equipped to able to help them and they've been programmed. Okay. Just go to an agency and they've got it from here. And those missionaries, because they haven't had certain things kind of forged into them by their local church about missions, yeah. end up just buying into a methodology that they don't, they don't agree with. And like, there's a conscience issue there, but they yeah. can't exactly point sure. out here's where my conscience is, is. Or they buy into it because they haven't been trained better. or they haven't been trained yeah. or, or they end up, reading something five and 10 years later down the road, like no shorts cuts to success or, yeah. or church membership by Lehman. And they read something and they're like, wait a second. Uh-huh. 
yes, this is what I believe. And then they ask questions of their missions leadership and their missions leadership's like, yeah, don't, don't read any of that. Yeah. Or uh, they just get kind of pushed to the side. And we've been meeting with missionaries coming off the field because they've had a kind of like an awakening overseas of like good theology yeah. and their agencies will not have anything of it. Mm. And some of them are getting fired. Mm -hmm. Some of them are having team implosions. Mm -hmm. And it's super sad to me because it's like, man, if, if we can only get lo local churches owning the task of yeah. equipping and training and sending out missionaries yeah. and agencies understand our role is coming alongside of them, exactly. I think we course correct. Yeah, because what we're saying is not that missions agencies are bad or even that they're not needed. It's just they can't be, they can't have the, the central role, right? That's they right. can't be the primary actors. No, we, we don't have a biblical, we, like we're, we're non-biblical <clears throat> is what I like to say. Like we're, we're not unbiblical. We can yeah. be unbiblical if we do, if we usurp authority from the local church, yeah. I can do unbiblical things as an agency. But as Andy Johnson talks about in his book on missions, Which I can come fantastic. along. It's such a good book. He's got this wonderful analogy about bride and bridesmaid. Sean, think about the travesty, <laughs> like it would be shocking if a bridesmaid of a wedding you were officiating actually just stood in front of the groom and held his hands mm -hmm. and like just kind of took the place of and the bride. And kissed him at the end. It would be yeah. totally. Yeah. Like there would be fights breaking out all over that building between the mother of the bride and the, like it just would be horrendous. That's what happens when missions agencies take the place of the bride by saying, hey, we've got this. No, a good a good bridesmaid adorns the bride. Mm. She makes sure that the ring's there, the flowers are there, mm. the, the dress is all laid out. She stands off in the side and she's ready at every beckoning and call of the bride to say, what do you need to do? My, my goal is to make you beautiful. Yes. And that's what we wanna do as a missions agency is say, okay, local church, you're it, like you're the bridesmaid. Sorry, you're the bride. We're the bridesmaid. Mm -hmm. So we're going to, we are going to do, make you do everything you can so that you can adorn the gospel beautifully. Mm -hmm. And the minute that I'm like, Hey, we could do this better than you. Uh, let, let's get in there. It should feel super awkward. And Ethan, let's make sure we clip that one, buddy. My boy's over here spitting fire. Uh, <clears throat> going back to the local church build, like training missionaries. Yeah. I think one of the reasons why we struggle with that is because of, of, of the way we think about training. That's right. Right. We think it's like this condensed, highly concentrated folk. And it can be that focus time where we learn about culture and language and praise God for radius and the good work that Super they're doing thankful. there. Yep. Yeah. But the vast majority of training for every missionary is what they receive in the local church. That's every right. Wednesday night Bible study, every Sunday morning sermon, all of the one another ministry in the local church. That is the vast majority of the formation that we need in missionaries before they go to the mission That's field. Absolutely right. And a year at radius or three months at this program or a, a degree from this institution is not going to counterbalance 15 years of unhealth in the local church. No. And, and less pastors be confused. There's very few seminaries out there that offer courses in ecclesiology. Oh, they're, they're just. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So um, I think Southern Seminary and a few other Southern Baptist uh, seminaries have Jonathan Lehman on as an adjunct professor, and you can That's go right. take an ecclesiology yeah. course with, with RTSDC. Yeah. I, I, yeah, RTSDC does that. Anytime students that are listening that you can take a course in ecclesiology, yeah. you, you should do that. That especially should if be, you can do it with Lehman. Especially if you can do it with because most of it's just part of your systematics, right? It's most just, of it is systematic three or yeah. systematic two, however they splice it. But it's and it, even then it's mixed in with the Holy Spirit. And what I want to say to missionaries and missions professors and pastors who think seminary is proficient for this, even in missions courses, you don't talk a ton about ecclesiology. It's, it's all about the art of crossing cultures. Mm -hmm. And those are important things, but they're yeah. not the main thing. So the way I would describe it is, Pastor, 95% of your person's missiology is actually going to be ecclesiology. Yeah, that's right. It, so when you, you mentioned Wednesday night Bible studies. You're teaching someone what it means to read God's word and understand it for themselves That's and right. giving even some of them when appropriate in the context, opportunity to teach on, on a Bible study. Yeah. Great. Sunday morning. I'm a regular principal guy. We pray the word, we preach the word, we see the word, we read the word. Yeah. So when we, when we pray the word, we're teaching, we're teaching our congregation how to pray. 
you're, you're teaching missionaries what it means to pray because one day that missionary is going to teach a brand new Christian, Lord willing, by uh -huh. his grace, how to pray. That's right. So what kind of prayers are you preaching in your Sunday morning gathering? Yeah. Are they Bible-centered prayers or are they man-centered prayers? Because your missionary is going to copy that. What songs are you singing? Right? Are they rich in theology? Mm. Uh, your missionary is going to go through some of the hardest times they'll ever face as they go overseas mm. in that first few years. The songs that you sing on a Sunday morning, mm. the Lord is going to bring those to mind. Christ, the sure and steady anchor, mm. how firm a foundation fast. he will hold me yeah. fast. Or are you, are you singing some type of trumped up, excitable song that it theologically weak? A, a big sloppy wet kiss from God is not a lyric that's going to sustain you through malaria. On that's the exactly, field. exactly yeah. right. So the, what songs <clears throat> are you singing? And, and again, that missionary Lord willing is going to lead somebody to Christ. And maybe that person is going to write hymns in their own language, in their own musical style mm. so that they can worship God and he can be worshiped amongst the nations, yeah. another nation. So what songs are you singing? Uh, how do you, how do you preach God's word? How do you exposit God's word? Like, are you, are you a flaky topical kind of, I'm just going to decide what it is I'm going to preach on. Are you going to teach somebody what it looks like to systematically go through God's word mm. and exposit it so that the meaning of the text is what's being exposited mm. and applied? Missionaries have to be able to do that. And then uh, seeing the word. So baptism and the Lord's supper, your people, whether or not they know it, the way that you practice the ordinances are you're, you're creating uh, and catechizing somebody for church formation as a missionary when they go overseas. Mm -hmm. So do you baptize members into the local church or do you just kind of baptize them and just kind of leave them out there with no church membership yeah. involved? As if that's even possible. Ontologically, it's Ontologically, not possible. It's not yeah. possible but it happens a ton, a right? Um, what Spontaneous baptisms, not spontaneous, but I am, I'm not a spontaneous baptism guy. I think yeah. you have to, and especially in other cultures where people can get caught up in the euphoria of seeing other people make this decision or it's another religion adopted. You have to be very, very careful on that yeah. end. And the Lord's Supper. So one of the most tra tra like devastating things that I think exists out there in the missions world is people just don't know the importance of the Lord's Supper and how it applies to the local church. So I hear f different stories about missionaries on a team not with reaching and teaching. They know not to do that. Uh, we got good good folks. But you hear missionaries taking the Lord's Supper as a team. Okay, but that's a church ordinance. <clears throat> that's right. Right? So pastor, are you? how are you fencing off the table? Mm -hmm. Are you fencing it off? How are you fencing it off the table? All of those things, Sean, catechize missionaries. It's it's like anatomy. When when you send a doctor to, to a special medical program, you're assuming they've taken their anatomy class. Mm. Pastor, when you're sending your missionary to, ra to, to Radius, you better believe Brooks believes that you've taught them basic anatomy mm -hmm. because Radius is a, is a fantastic finishing school. It's like going to, to heart school. Uh, I, I don't want someone operating on a heart who doesn't understand how the heart actually functions. Yeah. Don't teach them about a knife at, 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 at yeah. medical school if, if they don't even know what, how the way the bodies. Don't worry up. about contextualization if you don't even know what church membership is. It, it doesn't make any sense yeah. whatsoever. And, and I think because we're so woefully inadequate in our understanding of ecclesiology in our seminaries, you, you then have a lot of missions departments that are outside of the biblical studies program, which uh, that's awkward. That, that's unfortunate because now you don't have your New Testament scholars helping your missions guys interpret key New Testament texts about Paul's work in the, in the, the New yeah. Testament, huh. they're kind of doing it isolated. I think we've just got over a hundred years now of unfortunately pretty bland theology in our miss missiology. And it's, Go it's ahead. a travesty. When I, when I hear you say stuff like this, I think an Al Mohler, president of Southern, would, would sit here and he would amen every last thing you've said. Do you know, and gosh, I'm not trying to get you to say anything bad about <laughs> some of your main constituents. Currently enrolled at Southern right. Seminary. <laughs> but uh, I mean, are they, are, like, do you hear of any of these Baptist, especially Reformed Baptist seminaries, making any of these changes to, to improve? I have, I listen, I think the my props at Southern, I love them a lot. Um, I kind of developed a reputation amongst my classmates as the guy who was always quoting nine marks in his papers mm. because there was just no ecclesiology in the literature. Okay. There's, it's just, just, there's nothing there. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons why is our Southern Baptist institutions are connected to the Southern Baptist convention. And we have a, we have a broad ecclesiology that's permitted within the Baptist faith and message. 
And I think the minute you start to push on an ecclesiology and do we go, do, do we have this philosophy of ecclesiology or this philosophy of ecclesiology? This philosophy of ecclesiology is going to lead you to do pragmatic things in the field. This ecclesiology is going to uh, encourage you to, to be careful and use the ordinary means of grace and go slow and steady in, in the way that you approach the missionary task. To, to have a, a, a seminary jump into the middle of that, it's going to be a very brave seminary mm. because you've got, you've got churches with different persuasions sending out missionaries with different persuasions that are all meant to cooperate together in the Great Commission. And it just gets really, really dicey. Um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. I think, I think what we need to do is, is kind of restore, restore the theological components in such a way as that we can have rigorous, rigorous <clears throat> debates in our classroom where I'm not being told so much like, hey, this is just the way we do things or it's bland. I want to have robust theological debates in my missions classes with someone who's a bit more pragmatic in their understanding of baptism or their methodologies in the missions world. I want to have rigorous debates. I, I think the academy is the best place to have those. We're just, we're just not having a ton of them. Yeah. And it's for the sake of, I think, cooperation, which is a good impulse. Yeah. But then what happens is that we end up having these conversations through podcasts and through books. Yeah. And, and if we're, only, we're only catechizing the people who are picking up those books or reading those podcasts. Yeah. It's unfortunate. <clears throat> I, I don't remember who said it, but I heard once somebody say something like the seminaries are only going to do what they perceive is desired from Southern Baptists. That's right. And I'm not a Southern Baptist, by the way. So I'm, are you I'm, not? I'm not a Southern Baptist. Wow. I mean, I could be, but I'm not. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, which is one of the reasons why I appreciate nine marks yeah. because what they're doing is I think they're actually changing the conversation at the local church level. That's right. Now there's, I think 40,000, some odd churches in the Southern Baptist convention. So that a lot of change yet to come, but brother, I think I've seen an ecclesiology revival oh, yeah. uh, in my city, 55,000 people, but one of the most church cities in America, 10 years ago, I could not find anyone, anyone who believed in nine Mark stuff. I had lunch with a pastor recently, welcomed him to town, do what I always do, go to give him all these really good nine Marks books, expositional preaching elders, you know, uh, all this stuff. And he goes, oh yeah, I got this one I'm reading it. Oh, I'm using that one to train my deacons. And it's like that every time I turn around. Yep. So I, my hope, if I'm trying to be hopeful and not cynical for like the future of Southern and Southeastern and all these seminaries in relation to their ecclesiology training is that this sort of grassroots level revival in these churches that are beginning to value ecclesiology will start applying pressure so that these seminaries actually go, oh, okay, we will become more distinctly Baptist in the way we train missionaries to think about the church. I hope so. And I hope, I hope, I hope we don't go down the road of the Browns and, and the Harvards and the Yales and the Princetons. Yeah. And just kind of abandon our institutions. I think we need to lean into our institutions and so hold them don't give up on Southern. Do not give up. Southern's wonderful. Like yeah. again, like I got to take New Testament with Tom Schreiner. I, I had Ware and I had Wellam for systematics. Uh you you sent her to Jim Ham Hamilton for Old Testament. Mm. Like these are incredible scholars that shaped my missiology in many, many different ways, sitting in a systematic or you, you think about Haken and Wright teaching historical theology. Praise God. I'm so thankful. I'm also thankful for my missions profs. I just, I wish, I wish that we would have some of the, the rigorous debates within the yeah. missions world and the missions theological classes that we have in some of our other studies. Gotcha. Uh, so that's what I'm looking for. Now, I think, and again, <laughs> at the expense of maybe being controversial, when we look at seminary degrees, especially in the Southern Baptist world, like when I, when I hear that there are internships that people can do, that they can get six classes, 18 credits by going through an internship at like CHBC or something like that, Sean, like everybody should be doing that. Yeah. Like all of those pastoral <clears throat> ministry classes, uh, we should be taken through the context, taken through the context of a local church. Mm -hmm. And I, Southern is most valuable because of its relationship with Emmanuel Baptist and Clifton Baptist and Hunsinger Lane and Kenwood and Third Sojourn Avenue. and Third Avenue. And you go on all the churches around Louisville that students are attending. That's where they're getting their ecclesiology. I understand. Yeah. But man, uh, what about the students that are taking online classes that their, their elders aren't as uh, oh, yeah. leaning into these things? They're not leaning into these, these matters in the same yeah. way. 
how are they going to be equipped? And so I think, I think if we can proliferate internships and churches can be generous by sending yeah. uh, some of their members to go yeah. do internships at other churches and then come back. And there's so many, let's think about some other ones. Garrett Kell, Del Rey. Has, Del Rey is incredible. You know, Mount credit. Vernon. Mount Vernon with Aaron Menikoff. Aaron Menikoff, Michael Lawrence out in Portland. You've got Juan Sanchez is down at High Point, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You've got Raymond Johnson's in West Chester, yeah, Pennsylvania. Right. Uh, on a much lower note, Sean DeMar, Sixth Avenue Community Church, Decatur, Alabama. Bam, you can do that Luke one. Luke did it. Luke, would you recommend our internship? Oh, yeah. Luke oh, says, yeah. Yeah. But do Michael Lawrence. But do Michael Lawrence. Michael Lawrence is. Maybe do both. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Uh, Go ahead, brother. Yeah, I, I think I think Simeon Trust. You can get pre, you can get preaching credits through seminaries doing mm -hmm. stuff with Simeon Trust. So, like, I would just encourage uh, pastors. One of the ways that we can hold our institutions accountable is by looking at diverse ways to educate our people that yeah. actually bring sometimes a greater value in that yeah. specific job subject. Because yeah. that that seminary is going to course correct if they're finding that most students aren't taking this class, but they're taking this one uh -huh. outside of the institution, yeah. they're going to go, okay, wait a second. We want those enroll dollars. That's we right. want, <laughs> yeah. we, just we very want the number. Speaking, it's very yeah. pragmatic, but it, it's, it's true. true. Yeah. And so I think, I think we just need to constantly be seeing how can we do better at the seminary level in these things. One more thing on seminary, and then we're going to get back to reaching and yeah, teaching. Yeah. Just think about how preposterous it is that in seminary, where you go to be trained to be a pastor, to lead the church, that you don't have a course on the church. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, yeah. I, I had a guy at CHBC tell me, he said, I, I learned more about how to be a pastor, like how to actually be a pastor in five months at this internship than I did three years in seminary, right? Like you're, you're learning how to, it, the, uh, an ecclesiology class will cover everything from baptism and the Lord's Supper, church membership, church discipline, expositional preaching, all that stuff. Yeah. That's the vast majority of what you're going to do as a pastor. You're probably going to have two conversations in 30 years of ministry about textual criticism. That's right. You know, or or about some philosophical debate regarding inerrancy. Not, not that that stuff doesn't matter. Yes, it does matter. I'm talking about emphasis. Day in, day out, where the rubber meets the road, the thing where you're going to have to give an account of for the Lord, you're going to stand before him and give an account. It's all in this ecclesial ecclesiological realm. That's right. You know, so uh, yeah, it would seem wise for these seminaries to have a, a greater concentration of study in this area because it's the vast majority of what pastors do. It's true. And I, I think, so you, you look at ecclesiology, you look at preaching, and then you look at counseling. So again, yeah. Southern, we've got uh, Bob Jones and uh, Jeremy Pierre, phenomenal biblical counselors. Okay. Like you, you want to train up pastors, Give them some good counseling profs because yeah. you think about preaching, you think about the public ministry of the word, the private and ministry the private of the ministry word. of the yeah. word, and then you think about where am I actually doing it? It's in the context of my local church. Yeah, and then and then you kind of build off your seminary off of there. So, Amen. hey, I would just challenge maybe if a seminary took a bold step and got in a room with some of the guys at Nine Marks because it's a growing constituency within the Southern Baptist world. Yeah, and just say, hey. Jonathan, Mark, here's a white piece of paper. You, you have relationships with all these churches around the U.S. What, what would be a valuable, with all your experience with all these interns and all these seminarians, what would be a valuable seminary degree? It'd be really interesting to see what comes off that piece of paper. Yeah. And then you pull in, let's pull in Simeon Trust. Let's see what that's, let's pull in mm -hmm. Radius and see what missions training looks like. Yeah. I think you could have an incredibly robust, attractive seminary. And then turn it around and say, how much of this seminary could be done in the local church? Again, working hand in hand with the seminary institution. Yeah. But hey, come take a class with Jeremy Pierre on counseling and then do a practice in your own local church in which there's this symbiotic relationship yeah. between seminary and local church. Yeah. Getting back to the missions conversation, if we're training up our missionaries like that, where our seminaries are, are physically partnering mm. and they they do their best, I get it. I, I do yeah. not want to be seen as being negative. And, no. and, and But I think we can do better. And I think, I think we got to think outside of the box yeah. for the sake of our future. We could keep talking about this forever. Let's move on. Let's move back to reaching and teaching stuff. Yeah. Uh, let's say that I'm a young man or woman and I want to go to the mission field and uh, somebody makes a recommendation, reaching and teaching. And I reach out and, oh, what do you know? There's a representative of reaching to teaching, reaching and teaching in my area. And we sit down and talk. Uh, give me the reaching and teaching spiel, right? You kind of already did, did that a little bit, yeah. reformed, complementarian. But like, 
why why wouldn't I just go with the IMB if I'm in the SPC and careful? Uh, <laughs> or why wouldn't I go with some other organization? What what why would I choose to go with reaching and teaching? Yeah, that's a great question. We would start off by saying, hey, listen, if your church has an existing relationship with another organization, we don't want to replace that in any way. I think what we want to do is say to local churches and to the people that they send out, we can provide a an organization with alignment along all of the major theological categories, which carry themselves to be very, very important as it comes to the carrying out of the missionary task on the field. Yeah. So I, we've got workers in Latin America, Africa, Middle East, Asia, Europe that can jump on a Zoom call and 100% of the time have theological alignment on every second level theological category which means that all matters relating to the local church and and salvation and so forth, like they're going to be in agreement on. Ryan, in these troublesome times, it, it, aren't you drawing the lines too tightly? Don't we need broader partnership, broader yeah. affiliations? Great. Yeah, I love I love broad partnership where it's appropriate. Okay. When we're talking about planning churches together, if we can't attend the same local church here in the US, mm. why on earth are we mm. planning churches together overseas? Because we look at the last hundred and something years, brother, what we see is uh, that our desire for Catholicity and ecumenicism in the world of missions has meant that we set aside theological differences on a number of different categories. And then we only end up talking about a certain percentage of theology for the sake of unity. Uh -huh. And we're not giving the whole counsel of God. Teach them all that I commanded you how to do, Jesus right. told us in, in Matthew 28. So how can we teach everything that Jesus commanded us to do if we don't talk about a certain percentage of it? Because mm. we have disunity on our own team on these matters. Mm. And those things that uh, we can continue to gather together at local church, but have different views, like maybe eschatology. Yeah. Uh, what a wonderful way to show for Christian brothers and sisters that these are not essential in how we covenant together as a local church. And there, there's a good way to have charity with people that you disagree with within your own congregation. Yeah. I think if we can have local churches that are 100% bought in on uh, a, a strong theological statement of faith all around the world, whatever that looks like, contextually, whether they write it mm -hmm. down or not, mm -hmm. whatever that looks like, uh, I think what's really, really wonderful about that is that you can be truly Catholic, small c, um, in the way that you come alongside Presbyterian and Anglicans and even Baptists with different convictions than mm -hmm. you. And you can high five each other in, in the streets in the world. And as you're going off into your villages, uh, just saying, hey, we're so thankful that you're here and we're thankful that you're planting a gospel centered church. Yeah. We just wouldn't attend it because of our convictions, but praise yeah. God for the work that you're doing. What we've done in, in the whole ecumenical movement over the last 115 years or so since Edinburgh in 1910 is we've just kind of, Ah, let's just decide to set aside theology. Yeah. And then when you set aside theology, what comes in is sociology. Oof. And that's just been really, really gross. So what I want to do is recover back to the associationalism we saw in the great century of missions, especially in the beginning. Yeah. I want to say to a group of churches that all hang out together and have the same convictions, whether that's Pillar Network or Acme or, or another association that's like-minded and say, hey, brothers, you all do life together. Yeah. You all know that you have this common agreement. Why don't you send your missionaries together to go do something around the mm -hmm. world that like, just carries out your partnership in the gospel globally? Yeah. And you know they're going to get along. And in this case that they don't, yeah. you guys have such a strong connection here stateside that you're able to jump in. And rather than some member care personnel from a missions agency mm. doing it, the church helps to do it. And so what we want to offer to churches and to missionaries is a marketplace of like-mindedness that's not for everybody. But I think it's for a, a good number of, of evangelical Christians, yeah. specifically Baptists here, yeah. and say, what can we cooperate together? Here's the cool thing about that, okay. that I did not even foresee a few years ago. Now we've got our brothers and uh, brothers leading churches in places like Latin America and Europe. So you take Germany, you take Spain, you take Argentina. I've had conversations with brothers in those countries that like, we are all on board with you theologically. How can we work together in Great Commission work in missions. They want to send out missionaries and they want them to work alongside reaching and teaching people. Mm. That's amazing. And that's only possible because we've got common theological convictions yeah. with these brothers. And so I think, I think what we're trying to say to the missions world is, listen, all of you missions agencies, they're effectively the same thing. So I'm talking 
I'm not talking about the IMB because I think the IMB is an institution of itself for the denomination SBC. Yeah. It's not a denomination. They're going to get mad at me. For <laughs> Voluntary that. Association. Man sure. alive. There's, I'm going to get a letter tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Um, the IMB is an institution that helps Southern Baptists to cooperate. And if you're a member of a Southern Baptist church, you should think about, should I go through the IMB or not? And if your church has wonderful connections with the IMB yeah. and they can get you to from your local church over there to do what you want to do to a good team to a good team that you agree do, with and with yeah. all of your convictions praise god what a mm -hmm. good use of cooperative dollars yeah and i i pray that happens in every country around the world that Amen. i listen if reaching teaching didn't have to serve sbc churches because the all of that was happening that's great we'll yeah. we'll serve churches like yours sean who yeah. aren't sbc i'd be super thrilled with that but i think sometimes a local church for one reason or another can't send through the sbc and so they come to us and say, hey, would Reaching and Teaching be able to facilitate this partnership? And guess what? We have wonderful partnerships with our IMB friends around the world that are like-minded, that we're able to say, yeah, and we're going to work alongside yeah. the friend that because you've got a, a medical condition that you can't go through the IMB, you can still go work alongside that person. Praise mm -hmm. God. But man, all these, these big agencies, these behemoths that, that just look the same theologically, why not just combine? Okay. And and just like be one big org without seven different overheads, have one overhead, okay. have one building, not seven buildings, like just be lean. And if you're going to be kind of negating theological differences, number one, don't do it. But if you're going to do it, just don't, don't have all these institutions out here. Yeah. Because what I would rather have is donor dollars that are going towards all of these buildings for all of these institutions and and all of like seven presidents and seven yeah. vice presidents, all of this. Yeah. What if we could say, hey, Presbyterian friends, go start up a, a like-minded Presbyterian or kind of niche boutique, like go do that. Go, like we need big banks. We also like our little credit unions. We, we should think the same way about missions agencies. Mm -hmm. And I, I personally am dreaming of a day where I'm sitting around a table with missions leaders and each of them is different. I can't, I'm not looking at eight of them going like, you guys effectively just do the same thing and you're basically competing. Ugh, that's gross. Mm -hmm. Like just be a behemoth and great. That's that guy. But this is the Presbyterian guy. This is the Anglican guy. This is the Pentecostal guy, man, because of our theological convictions, here's our IMB guy. Like we all have a place at the table and there's really no competition because we all understand who does what, man, that's meaningful Catholicity, I think in the missions world. Mm. Uh, I don't know if we're ever going to get there, but seems unlikely. It's true because who everybody wants to keep doing the status quo, mm -hmm. and I, I think we just need a little bit of a disruptive technology to to kind of come into the industry and have people say on the front end, "Here are my theological convictions. Here's where my our missiological major practices are." And if you're not in alignment with these, maybe there's another organization for you. Yeah. And let's celebrate our theology rather than like putting it into the closet yeah. or, or just never talking about it. Well, on, on that note, especially brother, I think you would agree that, that you actually can't set your theology aside. You can say that uh, your view on baptism doesn't matter, but you're going to baptize somebody. And there's going to be a view of baptism yeah. built into the way you practice it. Or you can say that disagreements over the Lord's Supper doesn't matter. But when it comes time to celebrate the Lord's Supper, you're going to have a theology of the Lord's Supper. Female pastors, you can say, ah, we can disagree to disagree. I don't think that's true. Yeah. You're going to have a theology of all these things. And so, uh, yeah, why not self-consciously say we're going to have a tight shot group, a tight affinity on our doctrine and our philosophy of ministry. That's not to the exclusion. You're free to go do your ministry. You're free to partner. But in this voluntary association, we're going to voluntarily have a tight affinity group mm. so that we can just work together together in an easier way, mm. you know? Amen. Yeah, I think, would that be so? Would that be so? So you are the president. What does that mean? What does that look like? Is you're, are you just promoting the company? Are you trying to build it out? What, governing day-to-day -day operations? Yeah. So uh, we have workers currently in 46 different countries around the world. Mm. Uh, so in one- Name of, them alphabetically. Oh, <laughs> man, it take us a while. But one of the things that I'm responsible for is just making sure that our relationships with those missionaries, with their sending church, and with the local church that they're members of on the ground are all- being coordinated. Uh, we've got a wonderful team of regional leaders, member care personnel. Their whole job is, is strategizing relationship management, care, coming alongside of churches, 
So we're responsible for the care. We're responsible for the logistical support. So people donate money to reaching and teaching mm -hmm. to go towards the support of workers. So is the money being donated actually going out to support the work that it's being given towards? And so, so your background in that. finance really helpful. Super helpful. There. Yeah, super helpful. Plan that one out. Uh, ensuring security. So issues in the Middle East, Southeast Asia, always keeping an eye on security. So responsible for the security apparatus of the organization. Uh, part of my job is overseeing. Uh, Donor relations. So we've got a donor relations team as folks are giving towards reaching and teaching as an organization, making sure that those those relationships are good and vital and vibrant. And then finally, just the recruitment aspect of it. So we have a great team of mobilizers, we call them rather than recruiters. And their job is basically to build relationships with local churches. And with our understanding that the majority of those relationships may not end in someone going with reaching and teaching, but we're just building friendships with sure. local churches right. that if they end up going with another organization, we're really thankful that we can help to have that church think in a helpful way about missions. Yeah. So our mobilizers are often out there kind of just educating people through conversation. Yeah. Um, so super thankful for that. So even so. if they don't go with reaching and teaching, hopefully they will take some of that DNA with them. Totally. Okay. Totally. Especially from the sending church perspective. So yeah. we can kind of build up the sending churches as they're, yeah. the, as they're sending out. So these sending churches, even if they don't go with you guys for whatever reason, because yeah. life is weird. Uh, they may, they're still probably going to be looking for the right things. They're going to want a partnership with totally. the right people. Totally. And yeah. we're really happy to make connections all around the world for, for them as they're thinking about potential places to land mm -hmm. and doing uh, intelligence briefings for them, so to speak, in terms of, yeah, there's an actual need in this specific area. Yeah. Uh, there's agencies that are specialized in so much, not, not so much on theological differences or denominational differences, but more on like task. Yeah. So we want to, if someone's coming in and they want to go with reaching and teaching, and then they, maybe they look at wanting to do Bible translation. Well, there's organizations that do that wonderfully well, and that's all that they do. Mm -hmm. And they might be a better fit for them. Yeah. Praise God. We still want to have a relationship with that church to encourage yeah. them. Um, same with folks that only go to unreached language groups, uh -huh. right? Thankful for them. Um, we do we do a broader th uh, group of tasks than them, yeah. but we're really excited when someone's like, no, I want to go to an agency that this is all they do. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. We still would love to be an encouragement to your local church mm -hmm. as you do that. And so my job effectively is to coordinate internal resources, bring in external resources, and then network broadly across the world and then specifically amongst our tribes, so to speak. Yeah. Is there any, we're, we're gonna launch into a series of questions here. Is yeah. there anything that you would wanna say to anyone watching or listening about reaching and teaching that we haven't covered so far? Yeah, I, I, th I think I just really wanna be clear that I don't think reaching and teaching deserves to be the agency of choice for anybody. I think mm. for us, it's a delightful duty to serve local churches and missionaries that have a certain set of convictions. But I, I would want people to know that reaching and teaching um, were for those that have different theological convictions. As long as they're not doing pragmatic things in the field, yeah. uh, we're able to, to, to really get behind them. And I'm thankful for gospel-centered friends that are even doing pragmatic things. And I would disagree with them in doing that. And I would implore them like, please stop doing that because mm -hmm. it's so dangerous. But it doesn't mean we're not Christian brothers and sisters. Amen. And so I wanna make sure that people as, as much as we talk about our ther theological convictions, we're, we're often being accused of being uh, elitist. elitist and all of that stuff. And that's, I, I, if that's, if that's the, what comes with it, it's unfortunate. Yeah. But I think if people could really see through and say, hey, we're, we just want to be who we are. You be who you are, but let's be open and honest about it yeah. and encourage each other and openly disagree, but do it in a benevolent and, and yeah. caring way. I think hey. that, that that is of benefit to the nations. Wow. Going back to the reformed thing being one of the main characteristics, you think about Peter getting the answer right when he's talking to Jesus in Matthew 16, who do people say that I am? And Jesus is like, okay, you got the right answer, but just so you know, God revealed this to you. It's not like you're just some really smart guy. That's right. Same thing with a, a pastor, a church, an organization, strong convictions, good. Yeah. But let your reformed theology uh, inform the way that you hold those convictions graciously, compassionately, understanding that the only reason you have it right, if you do have it right, is because God has been exceedingly kind. Exceedingly kind. And the, the other thing I would add on, Sean, to what I, pe why I want people to know that what we do, we talk a lot about pastoring and we talk a lot about church planning. We've got folks doing evangelism and discipleship 
through the context of a, of a local church. And we've got people training up leaders around the world. We've got guys with PhDs that are going and doing theological training nice. all through the context of a healthy local church. Well, that's how I first met Reaching and Teaching. I was in the jungles of Peru and a guy was down there teaching a group of pastors like two hours north of me in the jungle. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, who are these people? That's right. Yeah. And so we've still got, we've got a team that do that wonderfully in various regions around the world. And they're going in to train guys in Old Testament, New Testament, hermeneutics, mm. homiletics, church history. And the... It's a result of pragmatic decisions being made where church planting has been kind of just minimized or mm -hmm. the understanding of church is this de minimis threshold or the missionary task has just been evangelism. Yeah. And it, let's just give them a Bible and let the Holy Spirit do the rest. Yeah. And so we've got folks that are constantly pushing in on that. So uh, if, if someone's interested in evangelism and church planting, uh, discipleship, theological training and have those convictions, I think reaching and teaching could be a fit for them. Yeah. I don't think it's necessarily the fit. Can you give out your cell number? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, www.rtim.org. <laughs> uh, I was recently uh, at a dinner with Harshit Singh mm. and uh, Russell Berger from the Defending Confirm infamous CPM DMM series. Uh, he quoted Mark Dever in talking about the Great Commission. And he, he said that we often only think about uh, the Great Commission in terms of going out to the nations. That's one dimension, going out. But we also forget that the promise is that the Lord will be with us to the end of the age, mm. right? So we don't, we, we don't think generationally. And I think going back to that, that pragmatism, and even earlier in our conversation, you were talking about this emphasis uh, on like, we have to reach the nations within this generation. That's right. But there's really no rush. That we don't need to manipulate. We don't need to cajole. We don't need to come up with crafty new schemes. We just need to be faithful and trust that if we're faithful to the word, Jesus is going to be with us throughout all the generations. Absolutely right. Yeah. And th he he gave that commission two thousand or so years ago. Yeah. And we we just need to keep being faithful until Christ's return. Yeah. I think I think that urgency urgency is good. Yeah. Good. Urgency misplaced can lead yes. to pragmatism. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that there are people dying without ever hearing the gospel, man, urgency. that should bring yeah. us to a sense of urgency. Yeah. But our reliance should be on the Lord and not on ourselves and how we go about that. I think urgency is mishandled when people talk about it in terms of uh, bringing about the return of Christ. Oh, Matthew 24, 14. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's absolutely. like, we have to do this quickly, reach all the nations, get them all reached so that Jesus will come back. And that's just, that's just not really what Jesus intended. Well, if you really want to get controversial, I just saw a statistic two days ago coming from Ethnologue, which is this organization that tracks the viability of languages. Okay. And there's this, a large percent of, of languages around the world are currently in the process of dying out within one generation. Yeah. So I, what I want to do is ask all of those missionaries that Matthew 24, 14, Revelation 7, 9, those are wonderful pictures. They're God's word. Yeah. But the way that you're holding them... How do you equate that with the fact that we know that languages are dying out? Like, mm -hmm. how do you square that? That's not how I get to my urgency. Yeah. I get to my urgency in that I believe that the local church is the gospel made visible. Mm -hmm. I think that as Christians, we have a duty to, to proclaim the glory of God to the ends of the earth. And man alive, I want to see healthy local churches in every community around the world. And it's not... It's not up to me whether someone comes to Christ or not. That's right. That is God's work alone. And I have to be, I have to recognize limitations. Yeah. We have economic limitations. We have physical limitations. There's so many limitations. We just got to trust the Lord, but we got to be faithful. And those yeah. things got to go together. I want to tell all the missions people what my mom used to tell me when I would get a speeding ticket. Hey, we want to get there, but we want to get there safely. Mm. One of the limitations is the speed limit. Uh, we want to go as fast as is possible That's while right. maintaining faithfulness. That's right. As fast as we can go. We want right. to save as many people as possible, but we never, not even an inch, want to cross out of faithfulness into pragmatism That's right. in order to go faster. Well, you think about the heart surgeon analogy that I talked about a few minutes ago, Sean. If, if I'm having a heart attack, all right, there's urgency in that. Yeah. Something needs to happen. Yeah. But I, I don't want <laughs> a the medical chainsaw. student <laughs> yeah. to come up to me and go, it's yeah. my first day in medical school, yeah. and I think I know what a scalpel is and where I'm supposed to uh -huh. cut. Okay, we're all in agreement that the urgency, I want the person who's carefully prepared for that task, who also gets the urgency 
and may take a little bit longer to do that heart surgery, but, but I've got a way right. better chance that's that, that right. it's being done right. Yeah. And if we're that careful with medical things, why are we not that careful mm -hmm. with eternal things? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, brother, we could talk about this all day. And maybe we should, maybe we should just keep going. <laughs> just keep going. Uh, somebody is watching this interview, listening to this interview, and they're thinking, okay, I want to start thinking more about missions. Uh, either maybe they're already a missionary and they want to think about it better, or maybe they're thinking about becoming a missionary and they want to start off on a good foot. Give us, and you you didn't get this question in advance, so that's nope. not fair to you, but give us five books that you would recommend for people to think well about missions. Yeah, so uh, Conversion, Michael Lawrence, Evangelism, Max Stiles, Missions by Andy Johnson. So all three of those are in those nine marks little colored books here. Absolutely right. Okay. I'm going to give a fourth one. Easy I'm, to read. Easy to read. Corporate Worship by Matt Merker. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think I'm going to do Compelling Community. Oof. by Dever and Dunlop. Now that is, those are five books that people probably aren't expecting when they're yeah. like thinking about missions. But if you've been listening to what we're saying, yeah. you've got to understand those elements. And so I would just, maybe I say, pick up the Building Healthy Church series and read read your way through yeah, it. Cause man, all of those so things smart. are going to be super yeah. element. Compel Even the compelling community one, pushing back on affinity based ministry models. Huge, yeah, huge. And they're talking about in terms of a local church context, but that that's playing itself out pragmatically all around the world in the, in the world mm -hmm. of missions. Uh, I think, I think no, no shortcut success was super, super helpful yeah. in, in what it was addressing. I think I would want missionaries to be very, very careful to learn culture and language, even if they're going to an English speaking church, Sean, yeah, okay. they should learn language and culture. Yeah. So uh, our East Asian brothers that are, or that are in East Asia right now that are pastoring in English speaking churches, it serves them to have the local language so that yeah. they can be discipling locals. That just makes a ton of sense. So no shortcuts is great. Mm. Um, read a couple biographies. Okay, so let's let's top five or maybe top three. Top if you three. have five, okay, top, top three. three missionary biographies. Yeah, so I would say um, To the Golden Shore, Adoniram Judson. Classic. Wonderful. I would say- And make sure you listen to Piper's message on that as well at the Desiring God Pastors Conference. Yeah. I mean, he, 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 I would actually say, listen to that message first to kind of prime the pump and then go read the book. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's good. Uh, uh, and by the way, Adoniram, good job becoming a Baptist, buddy. Hey, man. Hey, come hey, on now. He risked it all. He, he risked on the it boat all. on the way over. <laughs> Luther Rice, get back there and start up another <laughs> org. Yeah. Um, second one I would say would be, um, I think it's Paul Schleyline's book on John Payton. So John Payton has a wonderful autobiography, but I'm giving out a lot of books uh, names. So I think the smaller one by Paul Schleyline, The Banner of Truth Did on yeah. the life and theology of Payton is wonderful. And then the third one uh, that I would give out is one that Michael Haken wrote on the friendships of William Carey. Oh. And it is wonderful. I've not heard of this. Yeah. I think it, a, a missing element in our missions conversations or a missing setting is talking about the importance of friendships and spiritual friendship. Mm. And so I think- I think it gets real lonely out there on the it mission does. field. And, and yeah. Haken does a wonderful job talking about men like Andrew Fuller and a few others that were in that North Hampton, Hamptonshire group that were lifelong friends of Carrie's. Wow. And how they care, uh, just held the ropes from. That's so good. Uh, what are you reading right now? What am I reading right now? Yeah. I'm reading uh, Matt Martin's new book on reforming criminal justice. We interviewed him. It was Ooh. fantastic. Man, so uh, good. I have not cried my way through a book wow. recently like that one. Just, yeah. it's heavy. Oh, it's the bail heavy. reform chapter alone. Well, is... brother, we we recently, we we have had a friend who has found herself in the criminal justice system through some, what appears to be very unfortunate situations. Yeah, And it is... It, it's sobering yeah. to, 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 to read that book and then see kind of what's on the yeah. outside. So you would recommend? Would recommend it. And then I'm reading a fiction book right now called Wolf Hall. Totally forget the uh, author's name. Martins? Some, what's her name? No. Um, <sighs> this is going to kill me. It's about uh, not... Thomas mm -hmm. Cromwell. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm not a big fan of historical fiction. And somebody told me, you have to read this. You have to. Uh, sorry, my voice thing picked up. They said it's the closest thing to good history that you can get with a good story because the author is, uh, you know, basically a historian. It's phenomenal. Book, 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 book. Uh, Hillary Mantel. Hillary Mantel. The, the whole series is not equally as good, but Wolf Hall is phenomenal. Well, someone was telling me yesterday, Jonathan Rourke was telling me yesterday that bring up the bodies. 
I, I think it was another one in the series. And he was like, that one is amazing. So is that of the same? It's, okay. a, it's a trilogy uh, by Hilary Mantel. And so he recommends that one. It's, so that's what I'm reading, like a little bit of fiction, yeah. like a little bit of nonfiction. What are you reading in the Bible right now? Uh, I am currently in uh, Ephesians, uh, currently going through Ephesians 2 for like my hundredth time, which I absolutely love. It just never gets old. Never. It's the main uh, book that I use with discipleship. You know, Mark is kind of like a good evangelism go-to. Ephesians is a good uh, discipleship go-to. And I'm walking through Ephesians with a brother, uh, a, new, a newer brother in our church right now. I'm just getting so hype, mm. you know, I'm just getting, we're walking through it. I'm like, man, I forgot how good the gospel is. Yeah. And I'm, I'm so thankful in the, the structure of it, especially as a, as a pastor of a local church that I can read the first half of it. And it's like, okay, this is our theology. Yeah. And then our practice in the second half yeah. of the book, it's yeah. such a practical yeah. epistle. Who would you say has had the most influence on you in terms of like, how you think about the gospel, the church, so on and so forth. Yeah. Like. So, uh, growing up, my dad, um, oh, I love that answer. Yeah, man. So I always say that if I grow up to be like my dad, man, mm, praise it. God. Um, and I hope your son will say that about and you. I hope my, my son says about me and, yeah. uh, yeah, I think, I think from a men that weren't my dad category, I can think of three, I think John Piper and his work on soteriology, mm. uh, and the glory of God. Mm, so good. Did you ever watch his Tulip DVDs? Yeah. I can't find them anywhere, but no. they were, I mean, there's uh, there's a version of them out there, but like the original ones that I watched, I can't find. Super helpful. We used to hold watch parties with those. Oh, I mean, yeah. I can't teach it as well as he does in there. It's so good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, Mark Dever mm -hmm. and Ecclesiology and Lehman. I think I think Dever because yeah. he's just big, like we love Mark. Yeah. Jonathan and his writing have. He systematized everything. Oh, in, in a very helpful way. Jonathan's a writer. Mark yeah. is not a writer. Mark is Mark does what I call intuitional theology. That doesn't mean he doesn't read and doesn't mean he doesn't write. What I mean is he just has this kind of ability to like suss out the truth of a thing. Yeah. But if you then want him to turn around and like systematically explain that to you with a bunch of really high level arguments, He's just not going to do that. Well, and some of it comes down to just time. He's like, I just want yeah. to get back to pastoring my. He doesn't church. enjoy writing, yeah. but then Lehman comes along with the brain. Look at the brain on that guy, yeah. right? And yeah. and uh, the pen on that guy. Yeah. And then you know he just spends the last twenty years. Yeah. Yeah. For putting it down, and hopefully that work continues on until the Lord returns because it's so so important. Like we've covered Baptists, we have recovered our ecclesiology. Let us not waste it. Amen. Like brother. what an opportunity. Yeah. And then I would say. Um, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if it wasn't for David Platt. Yeah. So he's got to be in my my Mount Rushmore. Yeah. Um, I, super thankful. I recently had dinner with Matt Schmucker. Uh, he's actually here with Harshit. Yeah. And uh, he said, you know, I love all of the guys in our kind of circle. I love them. Uh, and I don't always agree with David on things that he says or does, you know, little things little here and things, there, yeah. little to medium things here and there. Yeah. And he says, but I'll tell you what, whenever I'm around David, I feel like, this man knows Jesus. Mm. Yeah. And I know when he said that, I was like, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. You know, there's just something there. And the Look, Lord's blessed it. I think, I think you watch the measure, of, uh, the measure of a man is really by watching the people that he has led. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I look at Mark mm -hmm. and I, I have gotten to become friends with so many of the men that he's meant, men that he's mentored mm -hmm. and you see the profound influence, you're like, okay, that's legit. Yeah, that's right. I see, I see the same thing with David in that um, the people who were working alongside of him at the IMB, uh, guys that are my friends now, Paul Aiken, Scott Logston, Zane, yeah. those guys, like they love David. Yeah. And Seb so, was like, I'm just going to go with David. Yeah. Yeah. Like for Seb to give up what he was doing, mm -hmm. Sebastian Traeger, former executive vice president of the IMB, to give up his entrepreneurial career mm -hmm. to go work at the IMB. That speaks a lot of who David is. Yeah. And then uh, Scott Logston recently went with reaching and teaching overseas. And just to see Scott, who is one of my closest friends, the way he talks about David. Yeah. I'm like, okay. So like super thankful for Radical, super thankful for Secret Church and all the things that happened through that. But man, he's had an impact on the men that have been closest to him. And I'm thankful for that. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Uh, it's unfortunate though that he is woke. He is a wolf. <laughs> 
I'm just kidding. There's a documentary. Oh, I out. saw it. There's, I saw it. I haven't seen the documentary. I saw a 10 minute trailer, which I mean, why would I watch the documentary <laughs> if in 10 minutes it's uh, thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah. I, all I know is that uh, the people uh, that I love that are at McLean uh, are just super saddened by it because that's not, that's not David. Yeah. And those are the people I trust. Yeah. They're the people that I know. And uh, we have to be very, very careful not to watch somebody's edited docu-series and come to conclusions without going and speaking to the people that have sat under someone's pastoral ministry for mm. years and say, okay, so how is that different from the person that you know? And again, I'm going to, I'm going to ride or die with Scott and Cindy Logston who loved David and have yeah. sat under his faithful ministry. Um, we have to be so, so careful that we don't get caught up in the world's um, gotcha schemes yeah. and then just put it out there for the world to watch on social media. Like yeah. how, like I'm watching that trailer, Sean, and I'm like, how does this make much of Jesus? Yeah. Like literally we're talking about a man who has committed his much of his ministry to encouraging young people and old people to give up everything for the sake of the gospel. And I've, I've seen people go, oh, well, his house has cost this much money. I'm sorry, but like, have you ever been in the DC area? <laughs> go drive around and look up, pull up Zillow yeah. and just start trying to look for places. Like, it's ridiculous what we're doing in terms of character assassination these days in the world. Yeah. Now, if you're going to have a disagreement with something theologically, leave it yeah. at that. Do not start taking personal attacks on yeah. people. If he said something publicly that you think you need to respond to publicly, do so. But do so without ad hominem, yes. you know, without trying to attack his character. And, yeah, making insinuations yeah. That, that are unhelpful. Uh, how, uh, how does that build up the body of Christ? Mm -hmm. uh, friend, who's pastoring you through coming up with all of this stuff? And Yeah. yeah, yeah. I wonder the people who made this documentary, are the pastors of the churches where, where they're, uh, hopefully they're, where they're at a church. Hopefully. Uh, maybe not, but if they are, I wonder, are their pastors like proud of them? Are they like, wow, you're really crushing it for Jesus with this project? Or yeah. are they like, I don't know, you know? Yeah. And pastor, if, you, if you're in that area and you are proud of them, I would just challenge you to get within whatever pastor's breakfast that David's a part of mm -hmm. and just get to know him yeah. and then see for yourself. Yeah. Uh, favorite book of all time. Favorite book of yeah. all and time. And you can do one fiction, one nonfiction if you want. Oh man, um, Sean, you have stumped me. I what book do I go to time after time after time? Time after time. Yeah, I would say uh, the book that I have appreciated the most that is a nonfiction book would probably be um, Desiring God by yeah. Piper. It's just a paradigm shift, man. God wants me to be happy yeah. and he wants me to be happy in him. And that's actually my duty. My job is my, to pursue yeah. happiness in Jesus. The duty of delight. Whew. Yeah. yeah. So that one, that one, I think just, it set me on the trajectory. Like I w wouldn't be reading Ecclesiology and I wouldn't be reading Platt if it wasn't for encountering uh, Piper in the early 2000s. Did you listen to the most recent pastor's talk on transcendence? No, not yet. Sorry, of, Jonathan. <laughs> uh, it's one of the better ones. Mark interrupts less than ever. Uh, Did they mute him? <laughs> well well done, Alberto. Done, <laughs> uh, one of the things that Jonathan asked him about the Young, Restless, and Reform movement, and, and, and Mark is quick to say, yeah, a lot of us contributed to that, but really the heart of that movement was John Piper's relentless emphasis on centering God. Mm. You know, just once people get a vision of God, reformation is going to take place. And nobody did that as well and as consistently and as passionately as John Piper. Oh, you know, and, and lived it out. Like uh, I, I was across and I ended up in a conversation with John uh, at one of our, our meals and I ended up talking to him about the, the beauty of uh, the doctrine of limited atonement, mm. like how, how it's just remarkable. Like, think about it. There is not one person who is in an eternal state of damnation who Christ's blood wasn't sufficient. Right. Like we believe in the absolute sufficiency and I'm, I'm like just <clears throat> getting all riled up about this. Mm -hmm. And then I literally have this moment where I look over at John Piper and I'm like, all right, I'm so sorry. This is like preaching to the choir. Like yeah. this is such yeah. a weird, but I'm so thankful 
I'm so thankful for his writing and Desiring God just set me on this incredible trajectory yeah. because it, it's Calvinism in its right place. Right. We we are not angry Calvinists. No, not haughty Calvinists. Ha not haughty Calvinists. Yeah. Like you've got that that Ed, Edwards style mm -hmm. of just delighting in the glory of mm -hmm. God. Yeah. It's wonderful. It's biblical. And, and joy is the most attractive, right? Like oh. angry Calvinism, not attractive. Proud Calvinism, and nor should it be, right? That's right. It's, it's it's straight from the flesh. But when a when a Christian indwelt by the Holy Spirit perceives your joy in God's grace, they're just drawn to it like a moth to a flame. It's wonderful because it, it's something the world just cannot offer ever, yeah. ever, ever, ever. Every and then, time, sorry, no, so non, nonfiction, um, I want to say it's a series of books by okay. a guy named Ian Rankin uh, on a Scottish detective named Rebus. And it's oh, you super lost weird already, man. and I've lost everybody, but I love, I love Gran. I love all the historical fiction things, but there's this, this, Scottish writer. Anna Did you Rankin. like his last one? The on the the Grand's last. Uh, I thought it was good. The, the wager. wager. I thought, I thought it, was it was good. Fine. It wasn't as good as no. uh, Killers of the Flower Moon, which was phenomenal. That one was phenomenal. Yeah, it was. It was like okay. It's like I think this is pretty much every yeah. boat that ever sunk somewhere and had people. Yeah. I'm sure this stuff happened. Yeah, but yeah, in ranking for me was. Is, is that is that historical fiction? No, it's it's oh, okay. literally a Scottish detective okay. who is often on the wrong side of law. Just interesting. I, I, I Didn't Sir Arthur Conan Doyle already do that? Well, with Sherlock? <laughs> Pretty sure. I love reading fiction because it actually makes me a better reader of nonfiction. It actually speeds up my my reading. Yeah. Uh, favorite food? Favorite food. Um, mango. So mango rice. Uh, oh, man. So mango and sticky already. rice from Thailand. Oh, dude. Have you ever had it? Uh, I, I have. Not from Thailand. I had it in Peru. Okay. But okay. when, when we lived in the jungle, you know, mango trees everywhere. Everywhere. And during the ripe season, I mean, you, you just couldn't eat another mango. It's just you eat, all you do is eat mango. But when a mango is perfectly, like you can't get them like that in the That's States. Right. You probably got them. If you're in a tropical environment, you get good, fresh, ripe mango. There's nothing like it, man. No. And then no. you, and I know it sounds weird to people to say add it to rice, but you have to understand that for the majority of the people around the world, rice is your base. Like you start with rice, and well, then you add whatever else you're going to add to the meal. Well, if you're if you're going to hate on on rice, you've got to have rice with uh, condensed coconut milk, <sighs> nice and yeah. sticky, and then you chop up some mango on that. And yeah, that's like if I have my choice on what's at the marriage supper of the lamb, Ooh. it's sticky rice and mango. Look at this. Mm. Okay. Uh, favorite candy or sweet? Favorite. So there's these, they've now come to the US, but I, I'm a sucker for these things called fuzzy peaches. Um, they're a Canadian. Aren't all peaches candy. fuzzy? They're candy okay. called fuzzy peaches. Okay. All right. um, lots of sugar. I've, yeah. I've had about five root canals and I'm pretty sure three <laughs> of them were related to okay. uh, fuzzy peach uh, consumption. Least favorite candy. Um, Jolly Ranchers just drive me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I did not see that one. Go. All right. Sorry. Is it like a texture thing or like it, it, they, they stick just to get your teeth? stuck on your teeth? You're know, like, come on now. Yeah. And they're just, it's such a sharp taste. It's an angular. <laughs> I, uh, I also don't want to just have to keep something compartmentalized in my mouth for that long. It's, it's like, true. let me eat you or not. I don't That's want exactly you to right. hang around. It's exactly right. Just get out of my mouth. Yeah. I'm careful. Uh, Favorite movie? Favorite movie, Braveheart. Dude, didn't even are think you, about you, it. I don't know what you call a. I know what a like an Anglophile is. Is there like a Scottophile? Like you just all things Scottish, man. Your favorite books, your favorite movie. Yeah, I love Scottish culture. Uh, you love Mel Gibson. You love everything yeah, he's ever done and said. Nope. <laughs> you agree nope, with him? <laughs> but man, Braveheart, Mel Gibson was amazing. When we were soldiers, Mel Gibson was amazing. Yeah. Um, he had a good run there, and then he just got. Crazy. Lethal Weapon. Mel Lethal Gibson. Weapon was fun. He was, <laughs> it was so it was fun. Fun, yeah. Yeah, but Braveheart for me, um, his some historical inaccuracies. Uh, yeah. But whenever I'm like loving my English friends, yeah. shout out to the Grace Guilford guys, love you. Yeah. But like whenever I want to just remind myself of yeah. what they've done to us for hundreds of mm -hmm. years, I put on Braveheart. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Are you wearing a kilt right now under the table? No, actually, I have a uh, true story. I have a kilt arriving in the next four weeks from Scotland. Why? Um, so I can bust it out for weddings. <laughs> Dude. Seriously. I, I went, I, I was know. in, I was in Glasgow in the summer and for my 40th birthday, my wife, uh, said, yeah, you can go get fitted for a kilt. 
<laughs> she, you had to ask so, for permission. Hey, man, you don't yeah. spend that amount of money without getting it oh, passed is it not by your wife. Cheap? It is not cheap. You can get cheap ones at the souvenir shops, but give I wanted me, like a Robertson a kill. I wanted our, so my clan fought um, with Robert the Bruce at the Battle of Bannockburn. True story. And they played this song called The Coming of the Robertsons onto the, onto the field. That's your last name. Sort of my last name. So when my wife and I got married, uh, two cool Scottish things, uh, we had our hands fasted. So if you watch Braveheart, uh, when him and his wife get married, they, <coughs> they tie tartan around their hands. It's called hand fasting. Okay. So we did that with the Robertson clan. Okay. So tying the knot, yeah. that's where it comes from. Oh, okay. Um, and then the second thing we do is we had a bagpiper and he played us into our reception. None of this corny dance music that people do. We had a full Not on like bagpiper. Not like Dropkick Murphy's bagpipe. No, no way. Yeah. We had a, a legit bagpiper walk us in with the song. He found it, the coming of the Robertsons wow. that my clan had played going into battle. And so you want to talk about marriage like, is a, is like a constant no battle. man i'm like are you kidding me like what one more manly thing yeah. is there to be played walking into your, your reception than what your forefathers and your wife was cool with. with that she thought it was cool right, she, awesome. i wanted to wear a kilt so this was our uh i did not wear that a was kilt. Your this was our common okay yeah. you got the song didn't get the kill but now you're a skirt wearing in four weeks you're gonna be kilt. rocking a skirt kill same, Dude, same thing. Sean, <laughs> Isn't there a verse about this in Leviticus about not wearing <laughs> women's clothing? <laughs> hey, man, I think it's man's clothing. It's, just, it's a kilt. It's not a skirt. Okay. All yeah. right. Uh, are you going to gird up your loins while you wear it if, if you have to? Like, You're not supposed to talk about these things. Okay. Well, brother, thank you so much uh, for coming on, for talking about reaching and teaching. I, I hope that the Lord blesses your ministry, that you guys continue to move in the right direction. I think reaching and teach, like when I think about like an ideal missionary, I think somebody who's been in a healthy church with all the nine marks, who uh, then maybe goes and gets good seminary Bible training mm -hmm. at at a you know any number of different institutions, uh, usually thinking more in terms of who they're studying under than the institution That's that right. they're at. And then they go to Radius to get their good finishing school on language and culture. And then they sign up with reaching and teaching and they go and take the gospel to the nations. That to me sounds like a, mm. a well-trained missionary. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Let's end on that note. Let me pray. Right. Father, thank you so much for my brother, Ryan. Uh, we pray that you will remind him of your grace every day. Uh, strengthen him by your grace every day. Your Holy Spirit working through your word and through the church uh, are the only means by which he can accomplish what you've called him to. Mm. We pray that you'll keep him holy. We pray that you'll protect him. Uh, from any, uh, well, from the world, the flesh and the devil. And we pray that you'll help him to be happy in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Going back to our conversation earlier about John Piper, we pray that that he will have a fragrance and aroma about him uh, that shows that he truly sees the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ and that that will be contagious uh, in all those interactions that he has on behalf of reaching and teaching. Lord, we pray that if reaching and teaching is faithful, you will bless their ministry until Jesus comes back or until you have a different uh, appointment for them. And if they move away from the gospel, if they move away from faithfulness, we pray that you will be merciful and in their ministry before they mm -hmm. uh, do anything dangerous or unhelpful. And we rejoice knowing that we can say amen together to a prayer like that because of our similar convictions. Uh, Lord, we pray all of this to the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.